God spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai at the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year after they had left Egypt. He said, Number the congregation of the people of Israel by clans and families, writing down the names of every male. You and Aaron are to register, company by company, every man who is twenty years and older who is able to fight in the army. Pick one man from each tribe who is head of his family to help you. These are the names of the men who will help you. From Reuben, Elizer son of Shadur. From Simeon, Shalumiel son of Zurishadai. From Judah, Nashan son of Ammonadab. From Issachar, Nethanel son of Zur. From Zebulun, Eliab son of Helen. From the sons of Joseph. From Ephraim, Elishama son of Amahad. From Manasseh, Gamaliel son of Pedasar. From Benjamin, Abidon son of Gideoni. From Dan, Ahazer son of Amishadai. From Asher, Hagiel son of Ochran. From Gad, Eliazaph son of Duel. From Naphtali, Ahira son of Anan. These were the men chosen from the congregation, leaders of their ancestral tribes, heads of Israel's military divisions. Moses and Aaron took these men who had been named to help and gathered the whole congregation together on the first day of the second month. The people registered themselves in their tribes according to their ancestral families, putting down the names of those who were twenty years old and older, just as God commanded Moses. He numbered them in the wilderness of Sinai. The line of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, the men were counted off head by head, every male twenty years and older who was able to fight in the army, registered by tribes according to their ancestral families. The tribe of Reuben numbered 46,500. The line of Simeon, the men were counted off head by head, every male twenty years and older who was able to fight in the army, registered by clans and families. The tribe of Simeon numbered 59,300. The line of Gad, the men were counted off head by head, every male twenty years and older who was able to fight in the army, registered by clans and families. The tribe of Gad numbered 45,650. The line of Judah, the men were counted off head by head, every male twenty years and older who was able to fight in the army, registered by clans and families. The tribe of Judah numbered 74,600. The line of Issachar, the men were counted off head by head, every male twenty years and older who was able to fight in the army, registered by clans and families. The tribe of Issachar numbered 54,400. The line of Zebulun, the men were counted off head by head, every male twenty years and older who was able to fight in the army, registered by clans and families. The tribe of Zebulun numbered 57,400. The line of Joseph, from son Ephraim the men were counted off head by head, every male twenty years and older who was able to fight in the army, registered by clans and families. The tribe of Ephraim numbered 40,500. And from son Manasseh the men were counted off head by head, every male twenty years and older who was able to fight in the army, registered by clans and families. The tribe of Manasseh numbered 32,200. The line of Benjamin, the men were counted off head by head, every male twenty years and older who was able to fight in the army, registered by clans and families. The tribe of Benjamin numbered 35,400. The line of Dan, the men were counted off head by head, every male twenty years and older who was able to fight in the army, registered by clans and families. The tribe of Dan numbered 62,700. The line of Asher, the men were counted off head by head, 
Every male 20 years and older who was able to fight in the army, registered by clans and families. The tribe of Asher numbered 41,500. The line of Naphtali, the men were counted off head by head, every male 20 years and older who was able to fight in the army, registered by clans and families. The tribe of Naphtali numbered 53,400. These are the numbers of those registered by Moses and Aaron, registered with the help of the leaders of Israel, twelve men, each representing his ancestral family. The sum total of the people of Israel twenty years old and over who were able to fight in the army, counted by ancestral family, was 603,550. The Levites, however, were not counted by their ancestral family along with the others. God had told Moses, the tribe of Levi is an exception, don't register them. Don't count the tribe of Levi, don't include them in the general census of the people of Israel. Instead, appoint the Levites to be in charge of the dwelling of the testimony, over all its furnishings and everything connected with it. Their job is to carry the dwelling and all its furnishings, maintain it, and camp around it. When it's time to move the dwelling, the Levites will take it down, and when it's time to set it up, the Levites will do it. Anyone else who even goes near it will be put to death. The rest of the people of Israel will set up their tents in companies, every man in his own camp under its own flag. But the Levites will set up camp around the dwelling of the testimony so that wrath will not fall on the community of Israel. The Levites are responsible for the security of the dwelling of the testimony. The people of Israel did everything that God commanded Moses. They did it all. God spoke to Moses and Aaron. He said, The people of Israel are to set up camp circling the tent of meeting and facing it. Each company is to camp under its distinctive tribal flag. To the east toward the sunrise are the companies of the camp of Judah under its flag, led by Nashan son of Ammonadab. His troops number 74,600. The tribe of Issachar will camp next to them, led by Nethanel son of Zur. His troops number 54,400. And the tribe of Zebulun is next to them, led by Eliab son of Helen. His troops number 57,400. The total number of men assigned to Judah, troop by troop, is 186,400. They will lead the march. To the south are the companies of the camp of Reuben under its flag, led by Elizer son of Shadur. His troops number 46,500. The tribe of Simeon will camp next to them, led by Shalumiel son of Zurishadai. His troops number 59,300. And the tribe of Gad is next to them, led by Eliazaph son of Duel. His troops number 45,650. The total number of men assigned to Reuben, troop by troop, is 151,450. They are second in the order of the march. The tent of meeting with the camp of the Levites takes its place in the middle of the march. Each tribe will march in the same order in which they camped, each under its own flag. To the west are the companies of the camp of Ephraim under its flag, led by Elishama son of Amahad. His troops number 40,500. The tribe of Manasseh will set up camp next to them, led by Gamaliel son of Pedasar. His troops number 32,200. And next to him is the camp of Benjamin, led by Abidon son of Gideoni. His troops number 35,400. The total number of men assigned to the camp of Ephraim, troop by troop, is 108,100. They are third in the order of the march. To the north are the companies of the camp of Dan under its flag, 
led by Ahizer son of Amishadai. His troops number 62,700. The tribe of Asher will camp next to them, led by Pagiel son of Akron. His troops number 41,500. And next to them is the tribe of Naphtali, led by Ahira son of Anan. His troops number 53,400. The total number of men assigned to the camp of Dan number 157,600. They will set out, under their flags, last in the line of the march. These are the people of Israel, counted according to their ancestral families. The total number in the camps, counted troop by troop, comes to 603,550. Following God's command to Moses, the Levites were not counted in with the rest of Israel. The people of Israel did everything the way God commanded Moses, they camped under their respective flags, they marched by tribe with their ancestral families. This is the family tree of Aaron and Moses at the time God spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai. The names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab the firstborn, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar, anointed priests ordained to serve as priests. But Nadab and Abihu fell dead in the presence of God when they offered unauthorized sacrifice to him in the wilderness of Sinai. They left no sons, and so only Eleazar and Ithamar served as priests during the lifetime of their father, Aaron. God spoke to Moses. He said, Bring forward the tribe of Levi and present them to Aaron so they can help him. They shall work for him and the whole congregation at the tent of meeting by doing the work of the dwelling. Their job is to be responsible for all the furnishings of the dwelling, ministering to the affairs of the dwelling as the people of Israel come to perform their duties. Turn the Levites over to Aaron and his sons, they are the ones assigned to work full time for him. Appoint Aaron and his sons to minister as priests, anyone else who tries to elbow his way in will be put to death. God spoke to Moses, I have taken the Levites from among the people of Israel as a stand-in for every Israelite mother's firstborn son. The Levites belong to me. All the firstborn are mine, when I killed all the firstborn in Egypt, I consecrated for my own use every firstborn in Israel, whether human or animal. They belong to me. I am God. God spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, count the Levites by their ancestral families and clans. Count every male a month old and older. Moses counted them just as he was instructed by the mouth of God. These are the names of the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. These are the names of the Gershonite clans, Libni and Shimi. The sons of Kohath by clan, Umram, Izar, Hebron, and Uziel. The sons of Merari by clan, Mali and Mushi. These are the clans of Levi, family by family. Gershon was ancestor to the clans of the Libnites and Shimites, known as the Gershonite clans. All the males who were one month and older numbered 7,500. The Gershonite clans camped on the west, behind the dwelling, led by Eliasaph son of Lael. At the tent of meeting the Gershonites were in charge of maintaining the dwelling and its tent, its coverings, the screen at the entrance to the tent of meeting, the hangings of the courtyard, the screen at the entrance to the courtyard that surrounded the dwelling and altar, and the cords, in short, everything having to do with these things. Kohath was ancestor to the clans of the Amramites, Izzerites, Hebronites, and Uzielites. These were known as the Kohathite clans. All the males who were one month and older numbered 8,600. The Kohathites were in charge of the sanctuary. The Kohathite clans camped on the south side of the dwelling, led by Elizaphan son of Uzziel. 
They were in charge of caring for the chest, the table, the lampstand, the altars, the articles of the sanctuary used in worship, and the screen, everything having to do with these things. Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, supervised the leaders of the Levites and those in charge of the sanctuary. Merari was ancestor to the clans of the Malites and the Mushites, known as the Merarite clans. The males who were one month and older numbered 6,200. They were led by Zuriel son of Abahel and camped on the north side of the dwelling. The Merarites were in charge of the frames of the dwelling, its crossbars, posts, bases, and all its equipment, everything having to do with these things, as well as the posts of the surrounding courtyard with their bases, tent pegs, and cords. Moses and Aaron and his sons camped to the east of the dwelling, toward the rising sun, in front of the tent of meeting. They were in charge of maintaining the sanctuary for the people of Israel and the rituals of worship. Anyone else who tried to perform these duties was to be put to death. The sum total of Levites counted at God's command by Moses and Aaron, clan by clan, all the males one month and older, number 22,000. God spoke to Moses, Count all the firstborn males of the people of Israel who are one month and older. List their names. Then set apart for me the Levites, remember, I am God, in place of all the firstborn among the people of Israel, also the livestock of the Levites in place of their livestock. I am God. So, just as God commanded him, Moses counted all the firstborn of the people of Israel. The total of firstborn males one month and older, listed by name, number 22,273. Again God spoke to Moses. He said, Take the Levites in place of all the firstborn of Israel and the livestock of the Levites in place of their livestock. The Levites are mine, I am God. Redeem the 273 firstborn Israelites who exceed the number of Levites by collecting five shekels for each one, using the sanctuary shekel, the shekel weighing 20 giras. Give that money to Aaron and his sons for the redemption of the excess number of Israelites. So Moses collected the redemption money from those who exceeded the number redeemed by the Levites. From the 273 firstborn Israelites he collected silver weighing 1,365 shekels according to the sanctuary shekel. Moses turned over the redemption money to Aaron and his sons, as he was commanded by the word of God. God spoke to Moses and Aaron. He said, Number the Kohathite line of Levites by clan and family. Count all the men from thirty to fifty years of age, all who enter the ministry to work in the tent of meeting. This is the assigned work of the Kohathites in the tent of meeting, care of the most holy things. When the camp is ready to set out, Aaron and his sons are to go in and take down the covering curtain and cover the chest of the testimony with it. Then they are to cover this with a dolphin skin, spread a solid blue cloth on top, and insert the poles. Then they are to spread a blue cloth on the table of the presence and set the table with plates, incense dishes, bowls, and jugs for drink offerings. The bread that is always there stays on the table. They are to cover these with a scarlet cloth, and on top of that spread the dolphin skin, and insert the poles. They are to use a blue cloth to cover the light-giving lampstand and the lamps, snuffers, trays, and the oil jars that go with it. Then they are to wrap it all in a covering of dolphin skin and place it on a carrying frame. They are to spread a blue cloth over the gold altar and cover it with dolphin skins and place it on a carrying frame. They are to take all the articles used in ministering in the sanctuary, wrap them in a blue cloth, cover them with dolphin skins, and place them on a carrying frame. 
They are to remove the ashes from the altar and spread a purple cloth over it. They are to place on it all the articles used in ministering at the altar, fire pans, forks, shovels, bowls, everything used at the altar, place them on the altar, cover it with the dolphin skins, and insert the poles. When Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy furnishings and all the holy articles, and the camp is ready to set out, the Kohathites are to come and do the carrying. But they must not touch the holy things or they will die. The Kohathites are in charge of carrying all the things that are in the tent of meeting. Eliezer son of Aaron the priest, is to be in charge of the oil for the light, the fragrant incense, the regular grain offering, and the anointing oil. He is to be in charge of the entire dwelling and everything in it, including its holy furnishings and articles. God spoke to Moses and Aaron, Don't let the tribal families of the Kohathites be destroyed from among the Levites. Protect them so they will live and not die when they come near the most holy things. To protect them, Aaron and his sons are to precede them into the sanctuary and assign each man his task and what he is to carry. But the Kohathites themselves must not go in to look at the holy things, not even a glance at them, or they will die. God spoke to Moses, Number the Jershonites by tribes according to their ancestral families. Count all the men from thirty to fifty years of age who enter the ministry of work in the tent of meeting. The Jershonites by family and clan will serve by carrying heavy loads, the curtains of the sanctuary and the tent of meeting, the covering of the tent and the outer covering of dolphin skins, the screens for the entrance to the tent, the cords, and all the equipment used in its ministries. The Jershonites have the job of doing the work connected with these things. All their work of lifting and carrying and moving is to be done under the supervision of Aaron and his sons. Assign them specifically what they are to carry. This is the work of the Gershonite clans at the tent of meeting. Ithamar son of Aaron the priest is to supervise their work. Number the Merorites by their ancestral families. Count all the men from thirty to fifty years of age who enter the ministry of work at the tent of meeting. This is their assigned duty as they go to work at the tent of meeting, to carry the frames of the dwelling, its crossbars, posts, and bases, as well as the posts of the surrounding courtyard with their bases, tent pegs, cords, and all the equipment related to their use. Assign to each man exactly what he is to carry. This is the ministry of the Merorite clans as they work at the tent of meeting under the supervision of Ithamar son of Aaron the priest. Moses, Aaron, and the leaders of the congregation counted the Kohathites by clan and family. All the men from thirty to fifty years of age who came to serve in the work in the tent of meeting, counted by clans, were 2,750. This was the total from the Kohathite clans who served in the tent of meeting. Moses and Aaron counted them just as God had commanded through Moses. The Jershonites were counted by clan and family. All the men from thirty to fifty years of age who came to serve in the work in the tent of meeting, counted by clan and family, were 2,630. This was the total from the Gershonite clans who served in the tent of meeting. Moses and Aaron counted them just as God had commanded. The Merorites were counted by clan and family. All the men from thirty to fifty years of age who came to serve in the work in the tent of meeting, counted by clan, were three thousand two hundred. This was the total from the Merorite clans. Moses and Aaron counted them just as God had commanded through Moses. So Moses and Aaron and the leaders of Israel counted all the Levites by clan and family. All the men from thirty to fifty years of age who came to do the work of serving and carrying the tent of meeting numbered 8,580. 
At God's command through Moses, each man was assigned his work and told what to carry. And that's the story of their numbering, as God commanded Moses. God spoke to Moses, command the people of Israel to ban from the camp anyone who has an infectious skin disease, anyone who has a discharge, and anyone who is ritually unclean from contact with a dead body. Ban male and female alike, send them outside the camp so that they won't defile their camp, the place I live among them. The people of Israel did this, banning them from the camp. They did exactly what God had commanded through Moses. God spoke to Moses, tell the people of Israel, when a man or woman commits any sin, the person has broken trust with God, is guilty, and must confess the sin. Full compensation plus 20% must be made to whoever was wronged. If the wronged person has no close relative who can receive the compensation, the compensation belongs to God and must be given to the priest, along with the ram by which atonement is made. All the sacred offerings that the people of Israel bring to a priest belong to the priest. Each person's sacred offerings are his own, but what one gives to the priest stays with the priest. God spoke to Moses, tell the people of Israel, say a man's wife goes off and has an affair, is unfaithful to him by sleeping with another man, but her husband knows nothing about it even though she has defiled herself. And then, even though there was no witness and she wasn't caught in the act, feelings of jealousy come over the husband and he suspects that his wife is impure. Even if she is innocent and his jealousy and suspicions are groundless, he is to take his wife to the priest. He must also take an offering of two quarts of barley flour for her. He is to pour no oil on it or mix incense with it because it is a grain offering for jealousy, a grain offering for bringing the guilt out into the open. The priest then is to take her and have her stand in the presence of God. He is to take some holy water in a pottery jar and put some dust from the floor of the dwelling in the water. After the priest has her stand in the presence of God he is to uncover her hair and place the exposure offering in her hands, the grain offering for jealousy, while he holds the bitter water that delivers a curse. Then the priest will put the woman under oath and say, If no man has slept with you and you have not had an adulterous affair and become impure while married to your husband, may this bitter water that delivers a curse not harm you. But if you have had an affair while married to your husband and have defiled yourself by sleeping with a man other than your husband, here the priest puts the woman under this curse, may God cause your people to curse and revile you when he makes your womb shrivel and your belly swell. Let this water that delivers a curse enter your body so that your belly swells and your womb shrivels. Then the woman shall say, Amen. Amen. The priest is to write these curses on a scroll and then wash the words off into the bitter water. He then is to give the woman the bitter water that delivers a curse. This water will enter her body and cause acute pain. The priest then is to take from her hands a handful of the grain offering for jealousy, wave it before God, and bring it to the altar. The priest then is to take a handful of the grain offering, using it as an exposure offering, and burn it on the altar, after this he is to make her drink the water. If she has defiled herself in being unfaithful to her husband, when she drinks the water that delivers a curse, it will enter her body and cause acute pain, her belly will swell and her womb shrivel. She will be cursed among her people. But if she has not defiled herself and is innocent of impurity, her name will be cleared and she will be able to have children. This is the law of jealousy in a case where a woman goes off and has an affair and defile herself while married to her husband, or a husband is tormented with feelings of jealousy because he suspects his wife. The priest is to have her stand in the presence of God and go through this entire procedure with her. 
The husband will be cleared of wrong, but the woman will pay for her wrong. God spoke to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel, tell them, If any of you, man or woman, wants to make a special Nazarite vow, consecrating yourself totally to God, you must not drink any wine or beer, no intoxicating drink of any kind, not even the juice of grapes, in fact, you must not even eat grapes or raisins. For the duration of the consecration, nothing from the grapevine, not even the seeds, not even the skin, may be eaten. Also, for the duration of the consecration you must not have your hair cut. Your long hair will be a continuing sign of holy separation to God. Also, for the duration of the consecration to God, you must not go near a corpse. Even if it's the body of your father or mother, brother or sister, you must not ritually defile yourself because the sign of consecration to God is on your head. For the entire duration of your consecration you are holy to God. If someone should die suddenly in your presence, so that your consecrated head is richly defiled, you must shave your head on the day of your purifying, that is, the seventh day. Then on the eighth day bring two doves or two pigeons to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting. The priest will offer one for the absolution offering and one for the whole burnt offering, purifying you from the ritual contamination of the corpse. You resanctify your hair on that day and reconsecrate your Nazarite consecration to God by bringing a yearling lamb for a compensation offering. You start over. The previous days don't count because your consecration was ritually defiled. These are the instructions for the time set when your special consecration to God is up. First, you are to be brought to the entrance to the tent of meeting. Then you will present your offerings to God, a healthy yearling lamb for the whole burnt offering, a healthy yearling ewe for an absolution offering, a healthy ram for a peace offering, a basket of unraised bread made of fine flour, loaves mixed with oil, and crackers spread with oil, along with your grain offerings and drink offerings. The priest will approach God and offer up your absolution offering and whole burnt offering. He will sacrifice the ram as a peace offering to God with the basket of unraised bread, and, last of all, the grain offering and drink offering. At the entrance to the tent of meeting, shave off the hair you consecrated and put it in the fire that is burning under the peace offering. After you have shaved the hair of your consecration, the priest will take a shoulder from the ram, boiled, and a piece of unraised bread and a cracker from the basket and place them in your hands. The priest will then wave them before God, a wave offering. They are holy and belong to the priest, along with the breast that was waved and the thigh that was offered. Now you are free to drink wine. These are the instructions for Nazarites as they bring offerings to God in their vow of consecration, beyond their other offerings. They must carry out the vow they have vowed following the instructions for the Nazarite. God spoke to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the people of Israel. Say to them, God bless you and keep you. God smile on you and gift you. God look you full in the face. And make you prosper. In so doing, they will place my name on the people of Israel I will confirm it by blessing them. When Moses finished setting up the dwelling, he anointed it and consecrated it along with all that went with it. At the same time he anointed and consecrated the altar and its accessories. The leaders of Israel, the heads of the ancestral tribes who had carried out the census, brought offerings. They presented before God six covered wagons and twelve oxen, a wagon from each pair of leaders and an ox from each leader. God spoke to Moses, Receive these so that they can be used to transport the tent of meeting. Give them to the Levites according to what they need for their work. 
Moses took the wagons and oxen and gave them to the Levites. He gave two wagons and four oxen to the Jershonites for their work and four wagons and eight oxen to the Merorites for their work. They were all under the direction of Ithamar son of Aaron the priest. Moses didn't give any to the Kohathites because they had to carry the holy things for which they were responsible on their shoulders. When the altar was anointed, the leaders brought their offerings for its dedication and presented them before the altar because God had instructed Moses, each day one leader is to present his offering for the dedication of the altar. On the first day, Nashan son of Ammonadab, of the tribe of Judah, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds, according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. This was the offering of Nashan son of Ammonadab. On the second day, Nethanel son of Zur, the leader of Issachar, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds, according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. This was the offering of Nethanel son of Zur. On the third day, Eliab son of Helen, the leader of the people of Zebulun, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. This was the offering of Eliab son of Helen. On the fourth day, Eliezer son of Shadur, the leader of the people of Reuben, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. This was the offering of Eliezer son of Shadur. On the fifth day, Shalumiel son of Zurishadai, the leader of the people of Simeon, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. 
This was the offering of Shalumiel son of Zurishaddai. On the sixth day, Eliazaph son of Duel, the leader of the people of Gad, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds, according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. This was the offering of Eliazaph son of Duel. On the seventh day, Elishama son of Amahad, the leader of the people of Ephraim, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds, according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. This was the offering of Elishama son of Amahad. On the eighth day, Gamaliel son of Pedazer, the leader of the people of Manasseh, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds, according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. This was the offering of Gamaliel son of Pedasur. On the ninth day, Abidon son of Gideoni, the leader of the people of Benjamin, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds, according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. This was the offering of Abidon son of Gideoni. On the tenth day, Ahazer son of Amishadai, the leader of the people of Dan, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds, according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. This was the offering of Ahazer son of Amishadai. On the eleventh day, Pagiel son of Akron, the leader of the people of Asher, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds, according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. 
a young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. This was the offering of Pagiel son of Ochran. On the twelfth day, Ahira son of Anan, the leader of the people of Naphtali, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds, according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. This was the offering of Ahira son of Anan. These were the dedication offerings of the leaders of Israel for the anointing of the altar. Twelve silver plates. Twelve silver bowls. Twelve gold vessels. Each plate weighed three and a quarter pounds and each bowl one and three quarter pounds. All the plates and bowls together weighed about sixty pounds, using the official sanctuary weight. The twelve gold vessels filled with incense weighed four ounces each, using the official sanctuary weight. Altogether the gold vessels weighed about three pounds. The sum total of animals used for the whole burnt offering together with the grain offering. Twelve bulls. Twelve rams. Twelve yearling lambs. For the absolution offering. Twelve he goats. The sum total of animals used for the sacrifice of the peace offering. Twenty-four bulls. Sixty rams. Sixty he goats. Sixty yearling lambs. These were the offerings for the dedication of the altar after it was anointed. When Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak with God, he heard the voice speaking to him from between the two angel cherubim above the atonement cover on the chest of the testimony. He spoke with him. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. This was the offering of Ahazer son of Amishadai. On the eleventh day, Pagiel son of Ochran, the leader of the people of Asher, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds, according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. This was the offering of Pagiel son of Ochran. On the twelfth day, Ahira son of Anan, the leader of the people of Naphtali, brought his offering. His offering was a silver plate weighing three and a quarter pounds and a silver bowl weighing one and three quarter pounds, according to the standard sanctuary weights, each filled with fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. A gold vessel weighing four ounces, filled with incense. A young bull, a ram, and a yearling lamb for a whole burnt offering. A he goat for an absolution offering. Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five yearling lambs to be sacrificed as a peace offering. 
This was the offering of Ahira son of Anan. These were the dedication offerings of the leaders of Israel for the anointing of the altar. Twelve silver plates. Twelve silver bowls. Twelve gold vessels. Each plate weighed three and a quarter pounds and each bowl one and three quarter pounds. All the plates and bowls together weighed about sixty pounds, using the official sanctuary weight. The twelve gold vessels filled with incense weighed four ounces each, using the official sanctuary weight. Altogether the gold vessels weighed about three pounds. The sum total of animals used for the whole burnt offering together with the grain offering. Twelve bulls. Twelve rams. Twelve yearling lambs. For the absolution offering. Twelve he goats. The sum total of animals used for the sacrifice of the peace offering. Twenty-four bulls. Sixty rams. Sixty he goats. Sixty yearling lambs. These were the offerings for the dedication of the altar after it was anointed. When Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak with God, he heard the voice speaking to him from between the two angel cherubim above the atonement cover on the chest of the testimony. He spoke with him. God spoke to Moses, Tell Aaron, Install the seven lamps so they will throw light in front of the lampstand. Aaron did just that. He installed the lamps so they threw light in front of the lampstand, as God had instructed Moses. The lampstand was made of hammered gold from its stem to its petals. It was made precisely to the design God had shown Moses. God spoke to Moses, Take the Levites from the midst of the people of Israel and purify them for doing God's work. This is the way you will do it, sprinkle water of absolution on them, have them shave their entire bodies, have them scrub their clothes. Then they will have purified themselves. Have them take a young bull with its accompanying grain offering of fine flour mixed with oil, plus a second young bull for an absolution offering. Bring the Levites to the front of the tent of meeting and gather the entire community of Israel. Present the Levites before God as the people of Israel lay their hands on them. Aaron will present the Levites before God as a wave offering from the people of Israel so that they will be ready to do God's work. Have the Levites place their hands on the heads of the bulls, selecting one for the absolution offering and another for the whole burnt offering to God to make atonement for the Levites. Then have the Levites stand in front of Aaron and his sons and present them as a wave offering to God. This is the procedure for setting apart the Levites from the rest of the people of Israel, the Levites are exclusively for my use. After you have purified the Levites and presented them as a wave offering to God, they can go to work in the tent of meeting. The Levites have been selected out of the people of Israel for my exclusive use, they function in place of every firstborn male born to an Israelite woman. Every firstborn male in Israel, animal or human, is set apart for my use. When I struck down all the firstborn of Egypt, I consecrated them for my holy uses. But now I take the Levites as stand-ins in place of every firstborn son in Israel, selected out of the people of Israel, and I have given the Levites to Aaron and his sons to do all the work involved in the tent of meeting on behalf of all the people of Israel and to make atonement for them so that nothing bad will happen to them when they approach the sanctuary. Moses, Aaron, and the entire community of the people of Israel carried out these procedures with the Levites, just as God had commanded Moses. The Levites purified themselves and scrubbed their clothes. Then Aaron presented them as a wave offering before God and made atonement for them to purify them. Only then did the Levites go to work at the tent of meeting. Aaron and his sons supervised them following the directions God had given. 
God spoke to Moses, These are your instructions regarding the Levites, At the age of twenty-five they will join the workforce in the tent of meeting, At the age of fifty they must retire from the work. They can assist their brothers in the tasks in the tent of meeting, but they are not permitted to do the actual work themselves. These are the ground rules for the work of the Levites. God spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after leaving Egypt, have the people of Israel celebrate Passover at the set time. Celebrate it on schedule, on the evening of the fourteenth day of this month, following all the rules and procedures. Moses told the people of Israel to celebrate the Passover and they did, in the wilderness of Sinai at evening of the fourteenth day of the first month. The people of Israel did it all just as God had commanded Moses. But some of them couldn't celebrate the Passover on the assigned day because they were ritually unclean on account of a corpse. So they presented themselves before Moses and Aaron on Passover and told Moses, We have become ritually unclean because of a corpse, but why should we be barred from bringing God's offering along with other Israelites on the day set for Passover? Moses said, Give me some time, I'll find out what God says in your circumstances. God spoke to Moses, Tell the people of Israel, if one or another of you is ritually unclean because of a corpse, or you happen to be off on a long trip, you may still celebrate God's Passover. But celebrate it on the fourteenth day of the second month at evening. Eat the lamb together with unraised bread and bitter herbs. Don't leave any of it until morning. Don't break any of its bones. Follow all the procedures. But a man who is richly clean and is not off on a trip and still fails to celebrate the Passover must be cut off from his people because he did not present God's offering at the set time. That man will pay for his sin. Any foreigner living among you who wants to celebrate God's Passover is welcome to do it, but he must follow all the rules and procedures. The same procedures go for both foreigner and native-born. The day the dwelling was set up, the cloud covered the dwelling of the tent of testimony. From sunset until daybreak it was over the dwelling. It looked like fire. It was like that all the time, the cloud over the dwelling and at night looking like fire. When the cloud lifted above the tent, the people of Israel marched out, and when the cloud descended the people camped. The people of Israel marched at God's command and they camped at His command. As long as the cloud was over the dwelling, they camped. Even when the cloud hovered over the dwelling for many days, they honored God's command and wouldn't march. They stayed in camp, obedient to God's command, as long as the cloud was over the dwelling, but the moment God issued orders they marched. If the cloud stayed only from sunset to daybreak and then lifted at daybreak, they marched. Night or day, it made no difference, when the cloud lifted, they marched. It made no difference whether the cloud hovered over the dwelling for two days or a month or a year, as long as the cloud was there, they were there. And when the cloud went up, they got up and marched. They camped at God's command and they marched at God's command. They lived obediently by God's orders as delivered by Moses. God spoke to Moses, Make two bugles of hammered silver. Use them to call the congregation together and give marching orders to the camps. When you blow them, the whole community will meet you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. When a bugle gives a single, short blast, that's the signal for the leaders, the heads of the clans, to assemble. When it gives a long blast, that's the signal to march. At the first blast the tribes who were camped on the east set out. At the second blast the camps on the south set out. The long blasts are the signals to march. 
The bugle call that gathers the assembly is different from the signal to march. The sons of Aaron, the priests, are in charge of blowing the bugles, it's their assigned duty down through the generations. When you go to war against an aggressor, blow a long blast on the bugle so that God will notice you and deliver you from your enemies. Also at times of celebration, at the appointed feasts and new moon festivals, blow the bugles over your whole burnt offerings and peace offerings, they will keep your attention on God. I am God, your God. In the second year, on the twentieth day of the second month, the cloud went up from over the dwelling of the testimony. At that the people of Israel set out on their travels from the wilderness of Sinai until the cloud finally settled in the wilderness of Paran. They began their march at the command of God through Moses. The flag of the camp of Judah led the way, rank after rank under the command of Nashon son of Ammonadab. Nethanel son of Zur commanded the forces of the tribe of Issachar, and Eliab son of Helen commanded the forces of the tribe of Zebulun. As soon as the dwelling was taken down, the Jershonites and the Merorites set out, carrying the dwelling. The flag of the camp of Reuben was next with Elizur son of Shadur in command. Shalumiel son of Zurishadai commanded the forces of the tribe of Simeon, Eliazaph son of Dul commanded the forces of the tribe of Gad. Then the Kohathites left, carrying the holy things. By the time they arrived the dwelling would be set up. The flag of the tribe of Ephraim moved out next, commanded by Elishama son of Amahad. Gamaliel son of Pedazer commanded the forces of the tribe of Manasseh, Abidon son of Gideoni commanded the forces of the tribe of Benjamin. Finally, under the flag of the tribe of Dan, the rear guard of all the camps marched out with Ahizer son of Amishadai in command. Hagiel son of Akron commanded the forces of the tribe of Asher, Ahira son of Anan commanded the forces of the tribe of Naphtali. These were the marching units of the people of Israel. They were on their way. Moses said to his brother-in-law Hobab son of Ruel the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we're marching to the place about which God promised, I'll give it to you. Come with us, we'll treat you well. God has promised good things for Israel. But Hobab said, I'm not coming, I'm going back home to my own country, to my own family. Moses countered, don't leave us. You know all the best places to camp in the wilderness. We need your eyes. If you come with us, we'll make sure that you share in all the good things God will do for us. And so off they marched. From the mountain of God they marched three days with the chest of the covenant of God in the lead to scout out a campsite. The cloud of God was above them by day when they marched from the camp. With the chest leading the way, Moses would say, Get up, God! Put down your enemies. Chase those who hate you to the hills. And when the chest was set down, he would say, Rest with us, God. Stay with the many. Many thousands of Israel. The people fell to grumbling over their hard life. God heard. When he heard his anger flared, then fire blazed up and burned the outer boundaries of the camp. The people cried out for help to Moses, Moses prayed to God and the fire died down. They named the place Tabra, Blaze, because fire from God had blazed up against them. The misfits among the people had a craving and soon they had the people of Israel whining, why can't we have meat? We ate fish in Egypt and got it free, to say nothing of the cucumbers and melons, the leeks and onions and garlic. But nothing tastes good out here, all we get is manna, manna, manna. Manna was a seed-like substance with a shiny appearance like resin. 
the people went around collecting it and ground it between stones or pounded it fine in a mortar. Then they boiled it in a pot and shaped it into cakes. It tasted like a delicacy cooked in olive oil. When the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna was right there with it. Moses heard the whining, all those families whining in front of their tents. God's anger blazed up. Moses saw that things were in a bad way. Moses said to God, Why are you treating me this way? What did I ever do to you to deserve this? Did I conceive them? Was I their mother? So why dump the responsibility of this people on me? Why tell me to carry them around like a nursing mother, carry them all the way to the land you promised to their ancestors? Where am I supposed to get meat for all these people who are whining to me, give us meat, we want meat. I can't do this by myself, it's too much, all these people. If this is how you intend to treat me, do me a favor and kill me. I've seen enough, I've had enough. Let me out of here. God said to Moses, Gather together seventy men from among the leaders of Israel, men whom you know to be respected and responsible. Take them to the tent of meeting. I'll meet you there. I'll come down and speak with you. I'll take some of the spirit that is on you and place it on them, they'll then be able to take some of the load of this people, you won't have to carry the whole thing alone. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves. Get ready for tomorrow when you're going to eat meat. You've been whining to God, we want meat, give us meat. We had a better life in Egypt. God has heard your whining and he's going to give you meat. You're going to eat meat. And it's not just for a day that you'll eat meat, and not two days, or five or ten or twenty, but for a whole month. You're going to eat meat until it's coming out your nostrils. You're going to be so sick of meat that you'll throw up at the mere mention of it. And here's why, because you have rejected God who is right here among you, whining to his face, oh, why did we ever have to leave Egypt? Moses said, I'm standing here surrounded by 600,000 men on foot and you say, I'll give them meat, meat every day for a month. So where's it coming from? Even if all the flocks and herds were butchered, would that be enough? Even if all the fish in the sea were caught, would that be enough? God answered Moses, So, do you think I can't take care of you? You'll see soon enough whether what I say happens for you or not. So Moses went out and told the people what God had said. He called together seventy of the leaders and had them stand around the tent. God came down in a cloud and spoke to Moses and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the seventy leaders. When the spirit rested on them they prophesied. But they didn't continue, it was a one-time event. Meanwhile two men, Eldad and Medad, had stayed in the camp. They were listed as leaders but they didn't leave camp to go to the tent. Still, the Spirit also rested on them and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua son of Nun, who had been Moses' right-hand man since his youth, said, Moses, Master. Stop them. But Moses said, Are you jealous for me? Would that all God's people were prophets? Would that God would put his spirit on all of them? Then Moses and the leaders of Israel went back to the camp. A wind set in motion by God swept quails in from the sea. They piled up to a depth of about three feet in the camp and as far out as a day's walk in every direction. All that day and night and into the next day the people were out gathering the quail, huge amounts of quail, even the slowest person among them gathered at least sixty bushels. 
they spread them out all over the camp for drying. But while they were still chewing the quail and had hardly swallowed the first bites, God's anger blazed out against the people. He hit them with a terrible plague. They ended up calling the place Kybroth Hadavava, Graves of the Craving. There they buried the people who craved meat. From Kybroth Hadavava they marched on to Hazroth. They remained at Hazroth. Miriam and Aaron talked against Moses behind his back because of his Cushite wife, he had married a Cushite woman. They said, Is it only through Moses that God speaks? Doesn't he also speak through us? God overheard their talk. Now the man Moses was a quietly humble man, more so than anyone living on earth. God broke in suddenly on Moses and Aaron and Miriam saying, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. The three went out. God descended in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance to the tent. He called Aaron and Miriam to him. When they stepped out, he said, Listen carefully to what I'm telling you. If there is a prophet of God among you, I make myself known to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But I don't do it that way with my servant Moses. He has the run of my entire house. I speak to him intimately, in person. In plain talk without riddles. He ponders the very form of God. So why did you show no reverence or respect? In speaking against my servant, against Moses, the anger of God blazed out against them. And then he left. When the cloud moved off from the tent, oh! Miriam had turned leprous, her skin like snow. Aaron took one look at Miriam, a leper. He said to Moses, Please, my master, please don't come down so hard on us for this foolish and thoughtless sin. Please don't make her like a stillborn baby coming out of its mother's womb with half its body decomposed. And Moses prayed to God. Please, God, heal her. Please heal her. God answered Moses, If her father had spat in her face, wouldn't she be ostracized for seven days? Quarantine her outside the camp for seven days. Then she can be readmitted to the camp. So Miriam was in quarantine outside the camp for seven days. The people didn't march on until she was readmitted. Only then did the people march from Hazroth and set up camp in the wilderness of Paran. God spoke to Moses, Send men to scout out the country of Canaan that I am giving to the people of Israel. Send one man from each ancestral tribe, each one a tried and true leader in the tribe. So Moses sent them off from the wilderness of Paran at the command of God. All of them were leaders in Israel, one from each tribe. These were their names. From Reuben, Shammua son of Zachar. From Simeon, Shaphat son of Hori. From Judah, Caleb son of Jephunneh. From Issachar, Egal son of Joseph. From Ephraim, Hosi son of Nun. From Benjamin, Palti son of Raphu. From Zebulun, Gadiel son of Sodi. From Manasseh, a Joseph tribe Gudi son of Susi. From Dan, Amiel son of Jamali. From Asher, Sether son of Michael. From Naphtali, Nabi son of Vavsi. From Gad, Gul son of Maki. These are the names of the men Moses sent to scout out the land. Moses gave Hoshi, Salvation, son of Nun a new name, Joshua, God saves. When Moses sent them off to scout out Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and then into the hill country. Look the land over, see what it is like. Assess the people, 
Are they strong or weak? Are there few or many? Observe the land, is it pleasant or harsh? Describe the towns where they live, are they open camps or fortified with walls? And the soil, is it fertile or barren? Are there forests? And try to bring back a sample of the produce that grows there, this is the season for the first ripe grapes. With that they were on their way. They scouted out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob toward Lebo Hamath. Their route went through the Negev desert to the town of Hebron. Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, descendants of the giant Anak, lived there. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they arrived at the Eshkol Valley they cut off a branch with a single cluster of grapes, it took two men to carry it, slung on a pole. They also picked some pomegranates and figs. They named the place Eshkol Valley, Grape Cluster Valley, because of the huge cluster of grapes they had cut down there. After forty days of scouting out the land, they returned home. They presented themselves before Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They reported to the whole congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told the story of their trip. We went to the land to which you sent us and, oh! It does flow with milk and honey. Just look at this fruit. The only thing is that the people who live there are fierce, their cities are huge and well fortified. Worse yet, we saw descendants of the giant Anak. Amalekites are spread out in the Negev, Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites hold the hill country, and the Canaanites are established on the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan. Caleb interrupted, called for silence before Moses and said, Let's go up and take the land, now. We can do it. But the others said, we can't attack those people, they're way stronger than we are. They spread scary rumors among the people of Israel. They said, we scouted out the land from one end to the other, it's a land that swallows people whole. Everybody we saw was huge. Why? We even saw the Nephilim giants, the Anak giants come from the Nephilim. Alongside them we felt like grasshoppers. And they looked down on us as if we were grasshoppers. The whole community was in an uproar, wailing all night long. All the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The entire community was in on it, why didn't we die in Egypt? or in this wilderness. Why has God brought us to this country to kill us? Our wives and children are about to become plunder. Why don't we just head back to Egypt? And right now? Soon they were all saying it to one another, let's pick a new leader, let's head back to Egypt. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in front of the entire community, gathered in emergency session. Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, members of the scouting party, ripped their clothes and addressed the assembled people of Israel, the land we walked through and scouted out is a very good land, very good indeed. If God is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land that flows, as they say, with milk and honey. And he'll give it to us. Just don't rebel against God. And don't be afraid of those people. Why, we'll have them for lunch. They have no protection and God is on our side. Don't be afraid of them. But, up in arms now, the entire community was talking of hurling stones at them. Just then the bright glory of God appeared at the tent of meeting. Every Israelite saw it. God said to Moses, how long will these people treat me like dirt? How long refuse to trust me? 
and with all these signs I've done among them. I've had enough, I'm going to hit them with a plague and kill them. But I'll make you into a nation bigger and stronger than they ever were. But Moses said to God, the Egyptians are going to hear about this. You delivered this people from Egypt with a great show of strength, and now this? The Egyptians will tell everyone. They've already heard that you are God, that you are on the side of this people, that you are present among them, that they see you with their own eyes in your cloud that hovers over them, in the pillar of cloud that leads them by day and the pillar of fire at night. If you kill this entire people in one stroke, all the nations that have heard what has been going on will say, since God couldn't get these people into the land which he had promised to give them, he slaughtered them out in the wilderness. Now, please, let the power of the Master expand, enlarge itself greatly, along the lines you have laid out earlier when you said, God, slow to get angry and huge in loyal love, forgiving iniquity and rebellion and sin. Still, never just whitewashing sin, but extending the fallout of parents' sins, to children into the third, even the fourth generation. Please forgive the wrongdoing of this people out of the extravagance of your loyal love just as all along, from the time they left Egypt, you have been forgiving this people. God said, I forgive them, honoring your words. But as I live and as the glory of God fills the whole earth, not a single person of those who saw my glory, saw the miracle signs I did in Egypt in the wilderness, and who have tested me over and over and over again, turning a deaf ear to me, not one of them will set eyes on the land I so solemnly promised to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with such repeated contempt will see it. But my servant Caleb, this is a different story. He has a different spirit, he follows me passionately. I'll bring him into the land that he scouted and his children will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and Canaanites are so well established in the valleys, for right now change course and head back into the wilderness following the route to the Red Sea. God spoke to Moses and Aaron, How long is this going to go on? all this grumbling against me by this evil infested community. I've had my fill of complaints from these grumbling Israelites. Tell them, as I live, God's decree, here's what I'm going to do, your corpses are going to litter the wilderness, every one of you twenty years and older who was counted in the census, this whole generation of grumblers and grousers. Not one of you will enter the land and make your home there, the firmly and solemnly promised land, except for Caleb son of Jephunneh and Joshua son of Nun. Your children, the very ones that you said would be taken for plunder, I'll bring in to enjoy the land you rejected while your corpses will be rotting in the wilderness. These children of yours will live as shepherds in the wilderness for forty years, living with the fallout of your whoring unfaithfulness until the last of your generation lies a corpse in the wilderness. You scouted out the land for forty days, your punishment will be a year for each day, a forty-year sentence to serve for your sins, a long schooling in my displeasure. I, God, have spoken. I will most certainly carry out these things against this entire evil-infested community which has banded together against me. In this wilderness they will come to their end. There they will die. So it happened that the men Moses sent to scout out the land returned to circulate false rumors about the land causing the entire community to grumble against Moses, all these men died. Having spread false rumors of the land, they died in a plague, confronted by God. Only Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh were left alive of the men who went to scout out the land. When Moses told all of this to the people of Israel, they mourned long and hard. But early the next morning they started out for the high hill country, saying, We're here, we're ready, 
let's go up and attack the land that God promised us. We sinned, but now we're ready. But Moses said, why are you crossing God's command yet again? This won't work. Don't attack. God isn't with you in this, you'll be beaten badly by your enemies. The Amalekites and Canaanites are ready for you and they'll kill you. Because you have left off obediently following God, God is not going to be with you in this. But they went anyway, recklessly and arrogantly they climbed to the high hill country. But the chest of the covenant and Moses didn't budge from the camp. The Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in the hill country came out of the hills and attacked and beat them, a route all the way down to Hormah. God spoke to Moses, speak to the people of Israel. Tell them, when you enter your homeland that I am giving to you and sacrifice a fire gift to God, a whole burnt offering for any sacrifice from the herd or flock for a vow offering or free will offering at one of the appointed feasts, as a pleasing fragrance for God, the one bringing the offering shall present to God a grain offering of two quarts of fine flour mixed with a quart of oil. With each lamb for the whole burnt offering or other sacrifice, prepare a quart of oil and a quart of wine as a drink offering. For a ram prepare a grain offering of four quarts of fine flour mixed with one and a quarter quarts of oil and one and a quarter quarts of wine as a drink offering. Present it as a pleasing fragrance to God. When you prepare a young bull as a whole burnt offering or sacrifice for a special vow or a peace offering to God, bring with the bull a grain offering of six quarts of fine flour and two quarts of oil. Also bring two quarts of wine as a drink offering. It will be a fire gift, a pleasing fragrance to God. Each bull or ram, each lamb or young goat, is to be prepared in this same way. Carry out this procedure for each one, no matter how many you have to prepare. Every native-born Israelite is to follow this procedure when he brings a fire gift as a pleasing fragrance to God. In future generations, when a foreigner or visitor living at length among you presents a fire gift as a pleasing fragrance to God, the same procedures must be followed. The community has the same rules for you and the foreigner living among you. This is the regular rule for future generations. You and the foreigner are the same before God. The same laws and regulations apply to both you and the foreigner who lives with you. God spoke to Moses, speak to the people of Israel. Tell them, when you enter the land into which I'm bringing you, and you eat the food of that country, set some aside as an offering for God. From the first batch of bread dough make a round loaf for an offering, an offering from the threshing floor. Down through the future generations make this offering to God from each first batch of dough. But if you should get off the beaten track and not keep the commands which God spoke to Moses, any of the things that God commanded you under the authority of Moses from the time that God first commanded you right up to this present time, and if it happened more or less by mistake, with the congregation unaware of it, then the whole congregation is to sacrifice one young bull as a whole burnt offering, a pleasing fragrance to God, accompanied by its grain offering and drink offering as stipulated in the rules, and a he-goat as an absolution offering. The priest is to atone for the entire community of the people of Israel and they will stand forgiven. The sin was not deliberate, and they offered to God the fire gift and absolution offering for their inadvertence. The whole community of Israel including the foreigners living there will be absolved, because everyone was involved in the error. But if it's just one person who sins by mistake, not realizing what he's doing, he is to bring a yearling she-goat as an absolution offering. The priest then is to atone for the person who accidentally sinned, to make atonement before God so that it won't be held against him. 
The same standard holds for everyone who sins by mistake, the native-born Israelites and the foreigners go by the same rules. But the person, native or foreigner, who sins defiantly, deliberately blaspheming God, must be cut off from his people, he has despised God's word, he has violated God's command, that person must be kicked out of the community, ostracized, left alone in his wrongdoing. Once, during those wilderness years of the people of Israel, a man was caught gathering wood on the Sabbath. The ones who caught him hauled him before Moses and Aaron and the entire congregation. They put him in custody until it became clear what to do with him. Then God spoke to Moses, give the man the death penalty. Yes, kill him, the whole community hurling stones at him outside the camp. So the whole community took him outside the camp and threw stones at him, an execution commanded by God and given through Moses. God spoke to Moses, speak to the people of Israel. Tell them that from now on they are to make tassels on the corners of their garments and to mark each corner tassel with a blue thread. When you look at these tassels you'll remember and keep all the commandments of God, and not get distracted by everything you feel or see that seduces you into infidelities. The tassels will signal remembrance and observance of all my commandments, to live a holy life to God. I am your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt to be your personal God. Yes, I am God, your God. Getting on his high horse one day, Korah son of Azar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, along with a few Reubenites, Dathan and Abram sons of Eliab, and on son of Peleth, rebelled against Moses. He had with him 250 leaders of the congregation of Israel, prominent men with positions in the council. They came as a group and confronted Moses and Aaron, saying, You've overstepped yourself. This entire community is holy and God is in their midst. So why do you act like you're running the whole show? On hearing this, Moses threw himself face down on the ground. Then he addressed Korah and his gang, In the morning God will make clear who is on his side, who is holy. God will take his stand with the one he chooses. Now, Korah, here's what I want you you, and your gang, to do, tomorrow, take censers. In the presence of God, put fire in them and then incense. Then we'll see who is holy, see whom God chooses. Sons of Levi, you've overstepped yourselves. Moses continued with Korah, listen well now, sons of Levi. Isn't it enough for you that the God of Israel has selected you out of the congregation of Israel to bring you near him to serve in the ministries of the dwelling of God, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them? He has brought you and all your brother Levites into his inner circle, and now you're grasping for the priesthood, too. It's God you've ganged up against, not us. What do you have against Aaron that you're bad-mouthing him? Moses then ordered Dathan and Abram, sons of Eliab, to appear, but they said, We're not coming. Isn't it enough that you yanked us out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? And now you keep trying to boss us around. Face it, you haven't produced, you haven't brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, you haven't given us the promised inheritance of fields and vineyards. You'd have to poke our eyes out to keep us from seeing what's going on. Forget it, we're not coming. Moses' temper blazed white hot. He said to God, don't accept their grain offering. I haven't taken so much as a single donkey from them, I haven't hurt a single hair of their heads. Moses said to Korah, bring your people before God tomorrow. Appear there with them and Aaron. Have each man bring his censer filled with incense and present it to God, all two hundred and fifty censers. And you and Aaron do the same, 
bring your censers. So they all did it. They brought their censers filled with fire and incense and stood at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Moses and Aaron did the same. It was Korah and his gang against Moses and Aaron at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The entire community could see the glory of God. God said to Moses and Aaron, Separate yourselves from this congregation so that I can finish them off and be done with them. They threw themselves on their faces and said, O oh God, God of everything living, when one man sins are you going to take it out on the whole community? God spoke to Moses, Speak to the community. Tell them, Back off from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abram. Moses got up and went to Dathan and Abram. The leaders of Israel followed him. He then spoke to the community, Back off from the tents of these bad men, Don't touch a thing that belongs to them lest you be carried off on the flood of their sins. So they all backed away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abram. Dathan and Abram by now had come out and were standing at the entrance to their tents with their wives, children, and babies. Moses continued to address the community, This is how you'll know that it was God who sent me to do all these things and that it wasn't anything I cooked up on my own. If these men die a natural death like all the rest of us, you'll know that it wasn't God who sent me. But if God does something unprecedented, if the ground opens up and swallows the lot of them and they are pitched alive into Sheol, then you'll know that these men have been insolent with God. The words were hardly out of his mouth when the earth split open. Earth opened its mouth and in one gulp swallowed them down, the men and their families, all the human beings connected with Korah, along with everything they owned. And that was the end of them, pitched alive into Sheol. The earth closed up over them and that was the last the community heard of them. At the sound of their cries everyone around ran for dear life, shouting, We're about to be swallowed up alive. Then God sent lightning. The fire cremated the 250 men who were offering the incense. God spoke to Moses, Tell Eleazar son of Aaron the priest, Gather up the censers from the smoldering cinders and scatter the coals a distance away for these censers have become holy. Take the censers of the men who have sinned and are now dead and hammer them into thin sheets for covering the altar. They have been offered to God and are holy to God. Let them serve as a sign to Israel, evidence of what happened this day. So Eleazar gathered all the bronze censers that belonged to those who had been burned up and had them hammered flat and used to overlay the altar, just as God had instructed him by Moses. This was to serve as a sign to Israel that only descendants of Aaron were allowed to burn incense before God, anyone else trying it would end up like Korah and his gang. Grumbling broke out the next day in the community of Israel, grumbling against Moses and Aaron, you have killed God's people. But it so happened that when the community got together against Moses and Aaron, they looked over at the tent of meeting and there was the cloud, the glory of God for all to see. Moses and Aaron stood at the front of the tent of meeting. God spoke to Moses, Back away from this congregation so that I can do away with them this very minute. They threw themselves face down on the ground. Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer and fill it with incense, along with fire from the altar. Get to the congregation as fast as you can, make atonement for them. Anger is pouring out from God, the plague has started. Aaron grabbed the censer, as directed by Moses, and ran into the midst of the congregation. The plague had already begun. He put burning incense into the censer and atoned for the people. He stood there between the living and the dead and stopped the plague. 14,700 people died from the plague, not counting those who died in the affair of Korah. 
Aaron then went back to join Moses at the entrance to the tent of meeting. The plague was stopped. God spoke to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel. Get staffs from them, twelve staffs in all, one from the leader of each of their ancestral tribes. Write each man's name on his staff. Start with Aaron, write Aaron's name on the staff of Levi and then proceed with the rest, a staff for the leader of each ancestral tribe. Now lay them out in the tent of meeting in front of the testimony where I keep appointments with you. What will happen next is this, the staff of the man I choose will sprout. I'm going to put a stop to this endless grumbling by the people of Israel against you. Moses spoke to the people of Israel. Their leaders handed over twelve staffs, one for the leader of each tribe. And Aaron's staff was one of them. Moses laid out the staffs before God in the tent of testimony. Moses walked into the tent of testimony the next day and saw that Aaron's staff, the staff of the tribe of Levi, had in fact sprouted, buds, blossoms, and even ripe almonds. Moses brought out all the staffs from God's presence and presented them to the people of Israel. They took a good look. Each leader took the staff with his name on it. God said to Moses, Return Aaron's staff to the front of the testimony. Keep it there as a sign to rebels. This will put a stop to the grumbling against me and save their lives. Moses did just as God commanded him. The people of Israel said to Moses, We're as good as dead. This is our death sentence. Anyone who even gets close to the dwelling of God is as good as dead. Are we all doomed? God said to Aaron, You and your sons, along with your father's family, are responsible for taking care of sins having to do with the sanctuary, you and your sons are also responsible for sins involving the priesthood. So enlist your brothers of the tribe of Levi to join you and assist you and your sons in your duties in the tent of testimony. They will report to you as they go about their duties related to the tent, but they must not have anything to do with the holy things of the altar under penalty of death, both they and you will die. They are to work with you in taking care of the tent of meeting, whatever work is involved in the tent. Outsiders are not allowed to help you. Your job is to take care of the sanctuary and the altar so that there will be no more outbreaks of anger on the people of Israel. I personally have picked your brothers, the Levites, from Israel as a whole. I'm giving them to you as a gift, a gift of God, to help with the work of the tent of meeting. But only you and your sons may serve as priests, working around the altar and inside the curtain. The work of the priesthood is my exclusive gift to you, it cannot be delegated, anyone else who invades the sanctuary will be executed. God spoke to Aaron, I am personally putting you in charge of my contributions, all the holy gifts I get from the people of Israel. I am turning them over to you and your children for your personal use. This is the standing rule. You and your sons get what's left from the offerings, whatever hasn't been totally burned up on the altar, the leftovers from grain offerings, absolution offerings, and compensation offerings. Eat it reverently, it is most holy, every male may eat it. Treat it as holy. You also get the wave offerings from the people of Israel. I present them to you and your sons and daughters as a gift. This is the standing rule. Anyone in your household who is richly clean may eat it. I also give you all the best olive oil, the best new wine, and the grain that is offered to God as the firstfruits of their harvest, all the firstfruits they offer to God are yours. Anyone in your household who is richly clean may eat it. You get every totally devoted gift. Every firstborn that is offered to God, whether animal or person, is yours. 
Except you don't get the firstborn itself, but its redemption price, firstborn humans and ritually unclean animals are bought back and you get the redemption price. When the firstborn is a month old it must be redeemed at the redemption price of five shekels of silver, using the standard of the sanctuary shekel, which weighs twenty geras. On the other hand, you don't redeem a firstborn ox, sheep, or goat, they are holy. Instead splash their blood on the altar and burn their fat as a fire gift, a pleasing fragrance to God. But you get the meat, just as you get the breast from the wave offering and the right thigh. All the holy offerings that the people of Israel set aside for God, I'm turning over to you and your children. That's the standard rule and includes both you and your children, a covenant of salt, eternal and unchangeable before God. God said to Aaron, You won't get any inheritance in land, not so much as a small plot of ground, I am your plot of ground, I am your inheritance among the people of Israel. I'm giving the Levites all the tithes of Israel as their pay for the work they do in the tent of meeting. Starting now, the rest of the people of Israel cannot wander in and out of the tent of meeting, they'll be penalized for their sin and the penalty is death. It's the Levites and only the Levites who are to work in the tent of meeting and they are responsible for anything that goes wrong. This is the regular rule for all time. They get no inheritance among the people of Israel, instead I turn over to them the tithes that the people of Israel present as an offering to God. That's why I give the ruling, they are to receive no land inheritance among the people of Israel. God spoke to Moses, speak to the Levites. Tell them, when you get the tithe from the people of Israel, the inheritance that I have assigned to you, you must tithe that tithe and present it as an offering to God. Your offerings will be treated the same as other people's gifts of grain from the threshing floor or wine from the wine vat. This is your procedure for making offerings to God from all the tithes you get from the people of Israel, give God's portion from these tithes to Aaron the priest. Make sure that God's portion is the best and holiest of everything you get. Tell the Levites, when you offer the best part, the rest will be treated the same as grain from the threshing floor or wine from the wine vat that others give. You and your households are free to eat the rest of it any time and any place, it's your wages for your work at the tent of meeting. By offering the best part, you'll avoid guilt, you won't desecrate the holy offerings of the people of Israel, and you won't die. God spoke to Moses and Aaron, this is the rule from the revelation that God commands, tell the people of Israel to get a red cow, a healthy specimen, ritually clean, that has never been in harness. Present it to Eliezer the priest, then take it outside the camp and butcher it while he looks on. Eliezer will take some of the blood on his finger and splash it seven times in the direction of the tent of meeting. Then under Eliezer's supervision burn the cow, the whole thing, hide, meat, blood, even its dung. The priest then will take a stick of cedar, some sprigs of hyssop, and a piece of scarlet material and throw them on the burning cow. Afterwards the priest must wash his clothes and bathe well with water. He can then come into the camp but he remains ritually unclean until evening. The man who burns the cow must also wash his clothes and bathe with water. He also is unclean until evening. Then a man who is richly clean will gather the ashes of the cow and place them in a richly clean place outside the camp. The congregation of Israel will keep them to use in the water of cleansing, an absolution offering. The man who gathered up the ashes must scrub his clothes, he is ritually unclean until evening. This is to be a standing rule for both native-born Israelites and foreigners living among them. Anyone who touches a dead body is ritually unclean for seven days. 
He must purify himself with the water of cleansing on the third day, on the seventh day he will be clean. But if he doesn't follow the procedures for the third and seventh days, he won't be clean. Anyone who touches the dead body of anyone and doesn't get cleansed desecrates God's dwelling and is to be excommunicated. For as long as the water of cleansing has not been sprinkled on him, he remains ritually unclean. This is the rule for someone who dies in his tent, anyone who enters the tent or is already in the tent is ritually unclean for seven days, and every open container without a lid is unclean. Anyone out in the open field who touches a corpse, whether dead from violent or natural causes, or a human bone or a grave is unclean for seven days. For this unclean person, take some ashes from the burned absolution offering and add some fresh water to it in a bowl. Find a richly clean man to dip a sprig of hyssop into the water and sprinkle the tent and all its furnishings, the persons who were in the tent, the one who touched the bones of the person who was killed or died a natural death, and whoever may have touched a grave. Then he is to sprinkle the unclean person on the third and seventh days. On the seventh day he is considered cleansed. The cleansed person must then scrub his clothes and take a bath, by evening he is clean. But if an unclean person does not go through these cleansing procedures, he must be excommunicated from the community, he has desecrated the sanctuary of God. The water of cleansing has not been sprinkled on him and he is ritually unclean. This is the standing rule for these cases. The man who sprinkles the water of cleansing has to scrub his clothes, anyone else who touched the water of cleansing is also ritually unclean until evening. Anything the ritually unclean man touches becomes unclean, and the person who touches what he touched is unclean until evening. In the first month, the entire company of the people of Israel arrived in the wilderness of Zin. The people stayed in Kadesh. Miriam died there, and she was buried. There was no water there for the community, so they ganged up on Moses and Aaron. They attacked Moses, we wish we died when the rest of our brothers died before God. Why did you haul this congregation of God out here into this wilderness to die, people and cattle alike? And why did you take us out of Egypt in the first place, dragging us into this miserable country? No grain, no figs, no grapevines, no pomegranates, and now not even any water. Moses and Aaron walked from the assembled congregation to the tent of meeting and threw themselves face down on the ground. And they saw the glory of God. God spoke to Moses, Take the staff. Assemble the community, you and your brother Aaron. Speak to that rock that's right in front of them and it will give water. You will bring water out of the rock for them, congregation and cattle will both drink. Moses took the staff away from God's presence, as commanded. He and Aaron rounded up the whole congregation in front of the rock. Moses spoke, Listen, rebels. Do we have to bring water out of this rock for you? With that Moses raised his arm and slammed his staff against the rock, once, twice. Water poured out. Congregation and cattle drank. God said to Moses and Aaron, Because you didn't trust me, didn't treat me with holy reverence in front of the people of Israel, you too aren't going to lead this company into the land that I am giving them. These were the waters of Meribah, bickering, where the people of Israel bickered with God, and he revealed himself as holy. Moses sent emissaries from Kadesh to the king of Edom with this message, a message from your brother Israel, you are familiar with all the trouble we've run into. Our ancestors went down to Egypt and lived there a long time. The Egyptians viciously abused both us and our ancestors. But when we cried out for help to God, 
he heard our cry. He sent an angel and got us out of Egypt. And now here we are at Kadesh, a town at the border of your land. Will you give us permission to cut across your land? We won't trespass through your fields or orchards and we won't drink out of your wells, we'll keep to the main road, the king's road, straying neither right nor left until we've crossed your border. The king of Edom answered, Not on your life. If you so much as set a foot on my land, I'll kill you. The people of Israel said, Look, we'll stay on the main road. If we or our animals drink any water, we'll pay you for it. We're harmless, just a company of footsore travelers. He answered again, No. You may not come through. And Edom came out and blocked the way with a crowd of people brandishing weapons. Edom refused to let them cross through his land. So Israel had to detour around him. The people of Israel, the entire company, set out from Kadesh and traveled to Mount Hor. God said to Moses and Aaron at Mount Hor at the border of Edom, it's time for Aaron to be gathered into the company of his ancestors. He will not enter the land I am giving to the people of Israel because you both rebelled against my orders at the waters of Meribah. So take Aaron and his son Eleazar and lead them up Mount Hor, remove Aaron's clothes from him and put them on his son Eleazar. Aaron will be gathered there, Aaron will die. Moses obeyed God's command. They climbed Mount Hor as the whole congregation watched. Moses took off Aaron's clothes and put them on his son Eleazar. Aaron died on top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. The whole congregation, getting the news that Aaron had died, went into thirty days of mourning for him. The Canaanite king of Arad, ruling in the Negev, heard that Israel was advancing up the road to Athram. He attacked Israel and took prisoners of war. Israel vowed a vow to God, If you will give this people into our power, we'll destroy their towns and present the ruins to you as a holy destruction. God listened to Israel's prayer and gave them the Canaanites. They destroyed both them and their towns, a holy destruction. They named the place Horma, holy destruction. The Snake of Fiery Copper They set out from Mount Hor along the Red Sea Road, a detour around the land of Edom. The people became irritable and cross as they traveled. They spoke out against God and Moses, Why did you drag us out of Egypt to die in this God-forsaken country? No decent food, no water, we can't stomach this stuff any longer. So God sent poisonous snakes among the people, they bit them and many in Israel died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke out against God and you. Pray to God, ask him to take these snakes from us. Moses prayed for the people. God said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a flagpole, whoever is bitten and looks at it will live. So Moses made a snake of fiery copper and put it on top of a flagpole. Anyone bitten by a snake who then looked at the copper snake lived. The people of Israel set out and camped at Oboth. They left Oboth and camped at I Abram in the wilderness that faces Moab on the east. They went from there and pitched camp in the Zird Valley. Their next camp was alongside the Arnon River, which marks the border between Amorite country and Moab. The Book of the Wars of God refers to this place. Wahab in Sufa. The Canyons of Arnon. Along the Canyon Ravines. That lead to the village Ar. And lean hard against. The border of Moab. They went on to Beer, the well, where God said to Moses, Gather the people, I'll give them water. 
That's where Israel sang this song. Erupt, well. Sing the song of the well. The well sunk by princes. Dug out by the people's leaders. Digging with their scepters and staffs. From the wilderness their route went from Madinah to Nehaliel to Bamoth, the heights, to the valley that opens into the fields of Moab from where Pisgah, the summit, rises and overlooks Jeshimon, wasteland. Israel sent emissaries to Sion, king of the Amorites, saying, Let us cross your land. We won't trespass into your fields or drink water in your vineyards. We'll keep to the main road, the king's road, until we're through your land. But Sion wouldn't let Israel go through. Instead he got his army together and marched into the wilderness to fight Israel. At Jahaz he attacked Israel. But Israel fought hard, beat him soundly, and took possession of his land from the Arnon all the way to the Jabbok right up to the Ammonite border. They stopped there because the Ammonite border was fortified. Israel took and occupied all the Amorite cities, including Heshbon and all its surrounding villages. Heshbon was the capital city of Sion king of the Amorites. He had attacked the former king of Moab and captured all his land as far north as the river Arnon. That is why the folk singers sing. Come to Heshbon to rebuild the city. Restore Sion's town. Fire once poured out of Heshbon. Flames from the city of Sion. Burning up Ar of Moab. The natives of Arnon's heights. Doom, Moab. The people of Chemosh, done for. Sons turned out as fugitives, daughters abandoned as captives. To the king of the Amorites, to Sion. Oh, but we finished them off. Nothing left of Heshbon as far as Dibon. Devastation as far off as Nopha. Scorched earth all the way to Mediba. Israel moved in and lived in Amorite country. Moses sent men to scout out Jazer. They captured its villages and drove away the Amorites who lived there. Then they turned north on the road to Bashan. O.G. king of Bashan marched out with his entire army to meet Moses in battle at Edrei. God said to Moses, Don't be afraid of him. I'm making a present of him to you, him and all his people and his land. Treat him the same as Sion king of the Amorites who ruled in Heshbon. So they attacked him, his sons, and all the people, there was not a single survivor. Israel took the land. The people of Israel marched on and camped on the plains of Moab at Jordan Jericho. Balak son of Zippior learned of all that Israel had done to the Amorites. The people of Moab were in a total panic because of Israel. There were so many of them. They were terrorized. Moab spoke to the leaders of Midian, Look, this mob is going to clean us out, a bunch of crows picking a carcass clean. Balak son of Zippir, who was king of Moab at that time, sent emissaries to get Balaam son of Beer, who lived at Pether on the banks of the Euphrates River, his homeland. Balak's emissary said, Look! A people has come up out of Egypt, and they're all over the place. And they're pressing hard on me. Come and curse them for me, they're too much for me. Maybe then I can beat them, we'll attack and drive them out of the country. You have a reputation, those you bless stay blessed, those you curse stay cursed. The leaders of Moab and Midian were soon on their way, with the fee for the cursing tucked safely in their wallets. When they got to Balaam, they gave him Balak's message. Stay here for the night, Balaam said. In the morning I'll deliver the answer that God gives me. The Moabite nobles stayed with him. 
Then God came to Balaam. He asked, So who are these men here with you? Balaam answered, Balak son of Zippir, king of Moab, sent them with a message, Look, the people that came up out of Egypt are all over the place. Come and curse them for me. Maybe then I'll be able to attack and drive them out of the country. God said to Balaam, Don't go with them. And don't curse the others, they are a blessed people. The next morning Balaam got up and told Balak's nobles, Go back home, God refuses to give me permission to go with you. So the Moabite nobles left, came back to Balak, and said, Balaam wouldn't come with us. Balak sent another group of nobles, higher ranking and more distinguished. They came to Balaam and said, Balak son of Zippier says, Please, don't refuse to come to me. I will honor and reward you lavishly, anything you tell me to do, I'll do, I'll pay anything, only come and curse this people. Balaam answered Balak's servants, Even if Balak gave me his house stuffed with silver and gold, I wouldn't be able to defy the orders of my God to do anything, whether big or little. But come along and stay with me tonight as the others did, I'll see what God will say to me this time. God came to Balaam that night and said, Since these men have come all this way to see you, go ahead and go with them. But make sure you do absolutely nothing other than what I tell you. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went off with the nobleman from Moab. As he was going, though, God's anger flared. The angel of God stood in the road to block his way. Balaam was riding his donkey, accompanied by his two servants. When the donkey saw the angel blocking the road and brandishing a sword, she veered off the road into the ditch. Balaam beat the donkey and got her back on the road. But as they were going through a vineyard, with a fence on either side, the donkey again saw God's angel blocking the way and veered into the fence, crushing Balaam's foot against the fence. Balaam hit her again. God's angel blocked the way yet again, a very narrow passage this time, there was no getting through on the right or left. Seeing the angel, Balaam's donkey sat down under him. Balaam lost his temper, he beat the donkey with his stick. Then God gave speech to the donkey. She said to Balaam, What have I ever done to you that you have beat me these three times? Balaam said, Because you've been playing games with me. If I had a sword I would have killed you by now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your trusty donkey on whom you've ridden for years right up until now? Have I ever done anything like this to you before? Have I? He said, No. Then God helped Balaam see what was going on, he saw God's angel blocking the way, brandishing a sword. Balaam fell to the ground, his face in the dirt. God's angel said to him, why have you beaten your poor donkey these three times? I have come here to block your way because you're getting way ahead of yourself. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she hadn't, I would have killed you by this time, but not the donkey. I would have let her off. Balaam said to God's angel, I have sinned. I had no idea you were standing in the road blocking my way. If you don't like what I'm doing, I'll head back. But God's angel said to Balaam, go ahead and go with them. But only say what I tell you to say, absolutely no other word. And so Balaam continued to go with Balak's nobles. When Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him in the Moabite town that was on the banks of the Arnon, right on the boundary of his land. Balak said to Balaam, Didn't I send an urgent message for help? Why didn't you come when I called? Do you think I can't pay you enough? Balaam said to Balak, 
Well, I'm here now. But I can't tell you just anything. I can speak only words that God gives me, no others. Balaam then accompanied Balak to Kiriath Huzoth, street town. Balak slaughtered cattle and sheep for sacrifices and presented them to Balaam and the nobles who were with him. At daybreak Balak took Balaam up to Bamoth Baal, the heights of Baal, so that he could get a good view of some of the people. Balaam said, Build me seven altars here, and then prepare seven bulls and seven rams. Balak did it. Then Balaam and Balak sacrificed a bull and a ram on each of the altars. Balaam instructed Balak, Stand watch here beside your whole burnt offering while I go off by myself. Maybe God will come and meet with me. Whatever he shows or tells me, I'll report to you. Then he went off by himself. God did meet with Balaam. Balaam said, I've set up seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Then God gave Balaam a message, return to Balak and give him this message. He went back and found him stationed beside his whole burnt offering and with him all the nobles of Moab. Then Balaam spoke his message oracle. Balak led me here from Aram, the king of Moab all the way from the eastern mountains. Go, curse Jacob for me. Go, damn Israel. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I damn whom God has not damned? From rock pinnacles I see them. From hilltops I survey them. Look! A people camping off by themselves. Thinking themselves outsiders among nations. But who could ever count the dust of Jacob? Or take a census of cloud of dust Israel? I want to die like these right living people. I want an end just like theirs. Balak said to Balaam, What's this? I brought you here to curse my enemies, and all you've done is bless them. Balaam answered, Don't I have to be careful to say what God gives me to say? Balak said to him, Go with me to another place from which you can only see the outskirts of their camp, you won't be able to see the whole camp. From there, curse them for my sake. So he took him to Watchman's Meadow at the top of Pisgah. He built seven altars there and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Balaam said to Balak, Take up your station here beside your whole burnt offering while I meet with him over there. God met with Balaam and gave him a message. He said, Return to Balak and give him the message. Balaam returned and found him stationed beside his whole burnt offering and the nobles of Moab with him. Balak said to him, What did God say? Then Balaam spoke his message oracle. On your feet, Balak. Listen. Listen carefully son of Zippier. God is not man, one given to lies. And not a son of man changing his mind. Does he speak and not do what he says? Does he promise and not come through? I was brought here to bless. And now he's blessed, how can I change that? He has no bone to pick with Jacob. He sees nothing wrong with Israel. God is with them. And they're with him, shouting praises to their king. God brought them out of Egypt. Rampaging like a wild ox. No magic spells can bind Jacob. No incantations can hold back Israel. People will look at Jacob and Israel and say, What a great thing has God done. Look, a people rising to its feet, stretching like a lion. A king of the beasts, aroused. Unsleeping, unresting until its hunt is over. And it's eaten and drunk its fill. Balak said to Balaam, Well, if you can't curse them, at least don't bless them. 
Balaam replied to Balak, Didn't I tell you earlier, all God speaks, and only what he speaks, I speak? Balak said to Balaam, Please, let me take you to another place. Maybe we can find the right place in God's eyes where you'll be able to curse them for me. So Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor, with a vista over the Jeshimon, wasteland. Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for sacrifice. Balak did it and presented an offering of a bull and a ram on each of the altars. By now Balaam realized that God wanted to bless Israel. So he didn't work in any sorcery as he had done earlier. He turned and looked out over the wilderness. As Balaam looked, he saw Israel camp tribe by tribe. The Spirit of God came on him, and he spoke his oracle message. Decree of Balaam son of Beer. Yes, decree of a man with twenty twentieths vision. Decree of a man who hears God speak. Who sees what the strong God shows him. Who falls on his face in worship. Who sees what's really going on. What beautiful tents, Jacob. Oh, your homes, Israel. Like valleys stretching out in the distance like gardens planted by rivers, like sweet herbs planted by the gardener God, like red cedars by pools and springs. Their buckets will brim with water. Their seed will spread life everywhere. Their king will tower over Agag and his ilk. Their kingdom surpassingly majestic. God brought them out of Egypt rampaging like a wild ox, gulping enemies like morsels of meat, crushing their bones, snapping their arrows. Israel crouches like a lion and naps. King of the beasts, who dares disturb him? Whoever blesses you is blessed. Whoever curses you is cursed. Balak lost his temper with Balaam. He shook his fist. He said to Balaam, I got you in here to curse my enemies and what have you done? Bless them. Bless them three times. Get out of here. Go home. I told you I would pay you well, but you're getting nothing. You can blame God. Balaam said to Balak, Didn't I tell you up front when you sent your emissaries? Even if Balak gave me his palace stuffed with silver and gold, I couldn't do anything on my own, whether good or bad, that went against God's command. I'm leaving for home and my people, but I warn you of what this people will do to your people in the days to come. Then he spoke his oracle message. Decree of Balaam son of Beer. Decree of the man with twenty twentieths vision. Decree of the man who hears godly speech. Who knows what's going on with the high God? Who sees what the strong God reveals? Who bows in worship and sees what's real? I see him, but not right now. I perceive him, but not right here. A star rises from Jacob. A scepter from Israel. Crushing the heads of Moab. The skulls of all the noisy windbags. I see Edom sold off at auction. Enemy seer marked down at the flea market. While Israel walks off with the trophies. A ruler is coming from Jacob. Who'll destroy what's left in the city. Then Balaam spotted Amalek and delivered an oracle message. He said. Amalek. You're in first place among nations right now. But you're going to come in last, ruined. He saw the Kenite and delivered his oracle message to them. Your home is in a nice secure place. Like a nest high on the face of a cliff. Still, you Kenite will look stupid. When Ashur takes you prisoner. 
Balaam spoke his final oracle message. Doom. Who stands a chance? When God starts in. Sea peoples, raiders from across the sea. Will harass Ashur and Eber. But they'll also come to nothing. Just like all the rest. Balaam got up and went home. Balak also went on his way. While Israel was camped at Shittim, Acacia Grove, the men began to have sex with the Moabite women. It started when the women invited the men to their sex and religion worship. They ate together and then worshipped their gods. Israel ended up joining in the worship of the Baal of Peor. God was furious, his anger blazing out against Israel. God said to Moses, Take all the leaders of Israel and kill them by hanging, leaving them publicly exposed in order to turn God's anger away from Israel. Moses issued orders to the judges of Israel, Each of you must execute the men under your jurisdiction who joined in the worship of Baal Peor. Just then, while everyone was weeping in penitence at the entrance of the tent of meeting, an Israelite man, flaunting his behavior in front of Moses and the whole assembly, paraded a Midianite woman into his family tent. Phinehas son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw what he was doing, grabbed his spear, and followed them into the tent. With one thrust he drove the spear through the two of them, the man of Israel and the woman, right through their midsections. That stopped the plague from continuing among the people of Israel. But 24,000 had already died. God spoke to Moses, Phinehas son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, has stopped my anger against the people of Israel. Because he was as zealous for my honor as I myself am, I didn't kill all the people of Israel in my zeal. So tell him that I am making a covenant of peace with him. He and his descendants are joined in a covenant of eternal priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. The name of the man of Israel who was killed with the Midianite woman was Zimri son of Salu, the head of the Simonite family. And the name of the Midianite woman who was killed was Cosby daughter of Zur, a tribal chief of a Midianite family. God spoke to Moses, from here on make the Midianites your enemies. Fight them tooth and nail. They turned out to be your enemies when they seduced you in the business of Peor and that woman Cosby, daughter of a Midianite leader, the woman who was killed at the time of the plague in the matter of Peor. After the plague God said to Moses and Eleazar son of Aaron the priest, number the entire community of Israel by families, count every person who is twenty years and older who is able to serve in the army of Israel. Obeying God's command, Moses and Eleazar the priest addressed them on the plains of Moab at Jordan Jericho, count off from age twenty and older. The people of Israel who came out of the land of Egypt. Reuben, Israel's firstborn. The sons of Reuben were Hanak and the Hanakite clan, Palu and the Paluite clan, Hezron and the Hezronite clan, Carmi and the Carmite clan. These made up the Reubenite clans. They numbered 43,730. The son of Palu, Eliab. The sons of Eliab, Nemuel, Dathan, and Abram. These were the same Dathan and Abram, community leaders from Korah's gang, who rebelled against Moses and Aaron in the Korah rebellion against God. The earth opened its jaws and swallowed them along with Korah's gang who died when the fire ate them up, all 250 of them. After all these years, there's still a warning sign. But the line of Korah did not die out. The sons of Simeon by clans. Nemuel and the Nemuelite clan. Jamin and the Jamanite clan. Jachin and the Jachinite clan. 
Zira and the Zirahite clan. Shal and the Shalite clan. These were the clans of Simeon. They numbered 22,200 men. The sons of Gad by clans. Zephan and the Zephanite clan. Haggai and the Haggite clan. Shuni and the Shunite clan. Ozni and the Oznite clan. Eri and the Arite clan. Arodi and the Aradite clan. Areli and the Arlite clan. These were the clans of Gad. They numbered 40,500 men. Er and Onan were sons of Judah who died early on in Canaan. The sons of Judah by clans. Shela and the Shelanite clan. Perez and the Perizzite clan. Zerah and the Zerahite clan. The sons of Perez. Hezron and the Hezronite clan. Hamel and the Hamulite clan. These were the clans of Judah. They numbered 76,500. The sons of Issachar by clans. Tola and the Tolate clan. Pua and the Puit clan. Jashub and the Jashubite clan. Shimron and the Shimronite clan. These were the clans of Issachar. They numbered 64,300. The sons of Zebulun by clans. Seard and the Seredite clan. Elon and the Elanite clan. Yaliel and the Jalielite clan. These were the clans of Zebulun. They numbered 60,500. The sons of Joseph by clans through Manasseh and Ephraim. Through Manasseh. Makir and the Makirite clan. Now Makir was the father of Gilead. Gilead and the Gileadite clan. The sons of Gilead. Ezer and the Ezerite clan. Helek and the Helekite clan. Asriel and the Azraelite clan. Shechem and the Shechemite clan. Shemida and the Shemidate clan. Hefer and the Heferite clan. Zelophehad son of Hefer had no sons, only daughters. Their names were Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tirzah. These were the clans of Manasseh. They numbered 52,700. The sons of Ephraim by clans. Shuthla and the Shuthlahite clan. Becker and the Beckerite clan. Tain and the Tahanite clan. The sons of Shuthla. Aaron and the Aaronite clan. These were the clans of Ephraim. They numbered 32,500. These are all the sons of Joseph by their clans. The sons of Benjamin by clans. Bela and the Belate clan. Ashbel and the Ashbelite clan. Ahiram and the Ahiramite clan. Shufam and the Shufamite clan. Hufam and the Hufamite clan. The sons of Bela through Ard and Naaman. Ard and the Ardite clan. Naaman and the Naamite clan. These were the clans of Benjamin. They numbered 45,600. The sons of Dan by clan. Shuham and the Shuamite clan. These are the clans of Dan, all Shuamite clans. They numbered 64,400. The sons of Asher by clan. Imna and the Imnite clan. Ishvi and the Ishvite clan. Bariah and the Bariite clan. The sons of Bariah. Heber and the Heberite clan. Malkiel and the Machielite clan. Asher also had a daughter, Sarah. These were the clans of Asher. They numbered 53,400. The sons of Naphtali by clans. 
Jaziel and the Jazielite clan. Guni and the Gunite clan. Jezer and the Jezerite clan. Shilam and the Shilamite clan. These were the clans of Naphtali. They numbered 45,400. The total number of the people of Israel, 601,730. God spoke to Moses, divide up the inheritance of the land based on population. A larger group gets a larger inheritance, a smaller group gets a smaller inheritance, each gets its inheritance based on the population count. Make sure that the land is assigned by lot. Each group's inheritance is based on population, the number of names listed in its ancestral tribe, divided among the many and the few by lot. These are the numberings of the Levites by clan. Gershon and the Gershonite clan. Kohath and the Kohathite clan. Merari and the Merarite clan. The Levite clans also included. The Libnite clan. The Hebronite clan. The Malite clan. The Mushite clan. The Korahite clan. Kohath was the father of Amram. Amram's wife was Jacobed, a descendant of Levi, born into the Levite family during the Egyptian years. Jacobed bore Aaron, Moses, and their sister Miriam to Amram. Aaron was the father of Nadab and Abihu, Eliezer and Ithamar, however, Nadab and Abihu died when they offered unauthorized sacrifice in the presence of God. The numbering of Levite males one month and older came to 23,000. They hadn't been counted in with the rest of the people of Israel because they didn't inherit any land. These are the ones numbered by Moses and Eleazar the priest, the people of Israel counted in the plains of Moab at Jordan Jericho. Not one of them had been among those counted by Moses and Aaron the priest in the census of the people of Israel taken in the wilderness of Sinai. For God had said of them, They'll die, die in the wilderness, not one of them will be left except for Caleb son of Jephunneh, and Joshua son of Nun. The daughters of Zelophehad showed up. Their father was the son of Hepher son of Gilead son of Machir son of Manasseh, belonging to the clans of Manasseh son of Joseph. The daughters were Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirzah. They came to the entrance of the tent of meeting. They stood before Moses and Eleazar the priest and before the leaders and the congregation and said, Our father died in the wilderness. He wasn't part of Korah's rebel anti-God gang. He died for his own sins. And he left no sons. But why should our father's name die out from his clan just because he had no sons? So give us an inheritance among our father's relatives. Moses brought their case to God. God ruled, Zelophehad's daughters are right. Give them land as an inheritance among their father's relatives. Give them their father's inheritance. Then tell the people of Israel, if a man dies and leaves no son, give his inheritance to his daughter. If he has no daughter, give it to his brothers. If he has no brothers, give it to his father's brothers. If his father had no brothers, give it to the nearest relative so that the inheritance stays in the family. This is the standard procedure for the people of Israel, as commanded by God through Moses. God said to Moses, Climb up into the Abram mountains and look over at the land that I am giving to the people of Israel. When you've had a good look you'll be joined to your ancestors in the grave, yes, you also along with Aaron your brother. This goes back to the day when the congregation quarreled in the wilderness of Zin and you didn't honor me in holy reverence before them in the matter of the waters, the waters of Meribah, quarreling, at Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. Moses responded to God, Let God, 
the God of the spirits of everyone living, set a man over this community to lead them, to show the way ahead and bring them back home so God's community will not be like sheep without a shepherd. God said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun, the spirit is in him, and place your hand on him. Stand him before Eleazar the priest in front of the entire congregation and commission him with everyone watching. Pass your magisterial authority over to him so that the whole congregation of the people of Israel will listen obediently to him. He is to consult with Eleazar the priest who, using the oracle Urim, will prayerfully advise him in the presence of God. He will command the people of Israel, the entire community, in all their comings and goings. Moses followed God's orders. He took Joshua and stood him before Eleazar the priest in front of the entire community. He laid his hands on him and commissioned him, following the procedures God had given Moses. God spoke to Moses, Command the people of Israel. Tell them, You're in charge of presenting my food, my fire gifts of pleasing fragrance, at the set times. Tell them, this is the fire gift that you are to present to God, two healthy yearling lambs each day as a regular whole burnt offering. Sacrifice one lamb in the morning, the other in the evening, together with two quarts of fine flour mixed with a quart of olive oil for a grain offering. This is the standard whole burnt offering instituted at Mount Sinai as a pleasing fragrance, a fire gift to God. The drink offering that goes with it is a quart of strong beer with each lamb. Pour out the drink offering before God in the sanctuary. Sacrifice the second lamb in the evening with the grain offering and drink offering the same as in the morning, a fire gift of pleasing fragrance for God. On the Sabbath, sacrifice two healthy yearling lambs, together with the drink offering and the grain offering of four quarts of fine flour mixed with oil. This is the regular Sabbath whole burnt offering, in addition to the regular whole burnt offering and its drink offering. On the first of the month offer a whole burnt offering to God, two young bulls, one ram, and seven male yearling lambs, all healthy. A grain offering of six quarts of fine flour mixed with oil goes with each bull, for quarts of fine flour mixed with oil with the ram, and two quarts of fine flour mixed with oil with each lamb. This is for a whole burnt offering, a pleasing fragrance, a fire gift to God. Also, drink offerings of two quarts of wine for each bull, one and a quarter quarts of wine for the ram, and a quart of wine for each lamb are to be poured out. This is the first of the month whole burnt offering to be made throughout the year. In addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its accompanying drink offering, a he goat is to be offered to God as an absolution offering. God's Passover is to be held on the 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day of this month hold a festival. For seven days, eat only unraised bread, begin the first day in holy worship, don't do any regular work that day. Bring a fire gift to God, a whole burnt offering, two young bulls, one ram, and seven male yearling lambs, all healthy. Prepare a grain offering of six quarts of fine flour mixed with oil for each bull, four quarts for the ram, and two quarts for each lamb, plus a goat as an absolution offering to atone for you. Sacrifice these in addition to the regular morning whole burnt offering. Prepare the food this way for the fire gift, a pleasing fragrance to God, every day for seven days. Prepare it in addition to the regular whole burnt offering and drink offering. Conclude the seventh day in holy worship, don't do any regular work on that day. On the day of firstfruits when you bring an offering of new grain to God on your feast of weeks, gather in holy worship and don't do any regular work. Bring a whole burnt offering of two young bulls, one ram, 
and seven male yearling lambs as a pleasing fragrance to God. Prepare a grain offering of six quarts of fine flour mixed with oil for each bull, four quarts for the ram, and two quarts for each lamb, plus a he-goat as an absolution offering to atone for you. These are all over and above the daily whole burnt offering and its grain offering and the drink offering. Remember, the animals must be healthy. On the first day of the seventh month, gather in holy worship and do no regular work. This is your day of trumpet blasts. Sacrifice a whole burnt offering, one young bull, one ram, and seven male yearling lambs, all healthy, as a pleasing fragrance to God. Prepare a grain offering of six quarts of fine flour mixed with oil for the bull, four quarts for the ram, and two quarts for each lamb, plus a he-goat as an absolution offering to atone for you. These are all over and above the monthly and daily whole burnt offerings with their grain offerings and drink offerings as prescribed, a pleasing fragrance, a fire gift to God. On the tenth day of this seventh month, gather in holy worship, humble yourselves, and do no work. Bring a whole burnt offering to God as a pleasing fragrance, one young bull, one ram, and seven yearling male lambs, all healthy. Prepare a grain offering of six quarts of fine flour mixed with oil for the bull, four quarts for the ram, and two quarts for each of the seven lambs. Also bring a he-goat as an absolution offering to atone for you in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. Gather in holy worship on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, do no regular work. Celebrate a festival to God for seven days. Bring a whole burnt offering, a fire gift of pleasing fragrance to God, thirteen young bulls, two rams, and fourteen yearling male lambs, all healthy. Prepare a grain offering of six quarts of fine flour mixed with oil for each of the bulls, four quarts for each ram, and two quarts for each of the fourteen lambs. Also bring a he-goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. On the second day, twelve young bulls, two rams, and fourteen yearling male lambs, all healthy. Prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and lambs following the prescribed recipes. And bring a he-goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. On the third day, eleven bulls, two rams, and fourteen male yearling lambs, all healthy. Prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and lambs following the prescribed recipes. And bring a he-goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. On the fourth day, ten bulls, two rams, and fourteen male yearling lambs, all healthy. Prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and lambs following the prescribed recipes. And bring a he-goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. On the fifth day, nine bulls, two rams, and fourteen male yearling lambs, all healthy. Prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and lambs following the prescribed recipes. And bring a he-goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. On the sixth day, eight bulls, two rams, and fourteen male yearling lambs, all healthy. Prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and lambs following the prescribed recipes. And bring a he-goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. On the seventh day, seven bulls, two rams, and fourteen male yearling lambs, 
all healthy. Prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and lambs following the prescribed recipes. And bring a he-goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. On the eighth day, gather in holy worship, do no regular work. Bring a fire gift of pleasing fragrance to God, a whole burnt offering, one bull, one ram, and seven male yearling lambs, all healthy. Prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and lambs following the prescribed recipes. And bring a he-goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. Sacrifice these to God as a congregation at your set feasts, your whole burnt offerings, grain offerings, drink offerings, and peace offerings. These are all over and above your personal vow offerings and free will offerings. Moses instructed the people of Israel in all that God commanded him. Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the people of Israel, This is what God commands. When a man makes a vow to God or binds himself by an oath to do something, he must not break his word, he must do exactly what he has said. When a woman makes a vow to God and binds herself by a pledge as a young girl still living in her father's house, and her father hears of her vow or pledge but says nothing to her, then she has to make good on all her vows and pledges. But if her father holds her back when he hears of what she has done, none of her vows and pledges are valid. God will release her since her father held her back. If she marries after she makes a vow or has made some rash promise or pledge, and her husband hears of it but says nothing to her, then she has to make good on whatever she vowed or pledged. But if her husband intervenes when he hears of it, he cancels the vow or rash promise that binds her. And God will release her. Any vow or pledge taken by a widow or divorced woman is binding on her. When a woman who is living with her husband makes a vow or takes a pledge under oath and her husband hears about it but says nothing and doesn't say she can't do it, then all her vows and pledges are valid. But if her husband cancels them when he hears about them, then none of the vows and pledges that she made are binding. Her husband has cancelled them and God will release her. Any vow and pledge that she makes that may be to her detriment can be either affirmed or annulled by her husband. But if her husband is silent and doesn't speak up day after day, he confirms her vows and pledges, she has to make good on them. By saying nothing to her when he hears of them, he binds her to them. If, however, he cancels them sometime after he hears of them, he takes her guilt on himself. These are the rules that God gave Moses regarding conduct between a man and his wife and between a father and his young daughter who is still living at home. God spoke to Moses, Avenge the people of Israel on the Midianites. Afterward you will go to be with your dead ancestors. Moses addressed the people, Recruit men for a campaign against Midian, to exact God's vengeance on Midian, a thousand from each tribe of Israel to go to war. A fighting force of a thousand from each tribe of Israel, twelve thousand in all, was recruited. Moses sent them off to war, a thousand from each tribe, and also Phinehas son of Eleazar, who went as priest to the army, in charge of holy vessels and the signaling bugles. They attacked Midian, just as God had commanded Moses, and killed every last man. Among the fallen were Evi, Recham, Zur, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. They also killed Balaam son of Beer with the sword. The people of Israel took the Midianite women and children captive and took all their animals and herds and goods as plunder. They burned to the ground all the towns in which Midianites lived and also their tent camps. 
They looted and plundered everything and everyone, belongings and people and animals. They took it all, captives and spoils and plunder, back to Moses and Eliezer the priest and the company of Israel where they were camped on the plains of Moab, at Jordan Jericho. Moses, Eliezer, and all the leaders of the congregation went to meet the returning army outside the camp. Moses was furious with the army officers, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, as they came back from the battlefield, what's this? You've let these women live. They're the ones who, under Balaam's direction, seduced the people of Israel away from God in that mess at Peor, causing the plague that hit God's people. Finish your job, kill all the boys. Kill every woman who has slept with a man. The younger women who are virgins you can keep alive for yourselves. Now here's what you are to do, pitch tents outside the camp. All who have killed anyone or touched a corpse must stay outside the camp for seven days. Purify yourselves and your captives on the third and seventh days. Purify every piece of clothing and every utensil, everything made of leather, goat hair, or wood. Eliezer the priest then spoke to the soldiers who had fought in the battle, this is the ruling from the revelation that God gave Moses, gold, silver, bronze, iron, tin, and lead, and anything else that can survive fire, must be passed through the fire, then it will be ritually purified. It must also be ritually washed in the water of cleansing. Further, whatever cannot survive fire must be put through that water. On the seventh day scrub your clothes, you will be ritually clean. Then you can return to camp. God said to Moses, I want you and Eliezer the priest and the family leaders in the community to count the captives, people and animals. Split the plunder between the soldiers who fought the battle and the rest of the congregation. Then tax the spoils that go to the soldiers at the rate of one life out of five hundred, whether humans, cattle, donkeys, or sheep. It's a god tax taken from their half-share to be turned over to Eliezer the priest on behalf of God. Tax the congregation's half-share at the rate of one life out of fifty, whether persons, cattle, donkeys, sheep, goats, or other animals. Give this to the Levites who are in charge of the care of God's dwelling. Moses and Eliezer followed through with what God had commanded Moses. The rest of the plunder taken by the army. 000 sheep. 000 cattle. 000 donkeys. 000 women who were virgins. The half share for those who had fought in the war. 500 sheep with a tax of 675 for God. 000 cattle, with a tax of 72 for God. 500 donkeys, with a tax of 61 for God. 000 people, with a tax of 32 for God. Moses turned the tax over to Eliezer the priest as God's part, following God's instructions to Moses. The other half share for the Israelite community that Moses set apart from what was given to the men who fought the war was 500 sheep 000 cattle 500 donkeys 000 people From the half share going to the people of Israel, Moses, just as God had instructed him, picked one out of every fifty persons and animals and gave them to the Levites, who were in charge of maintaining God's dwelling. The military officers, commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, came to Moses and said, We have counted the soldiers under our command and not a man is missing. We've brought offerings to God from the gold jewelry we got, armlets, bracelets, rings, earrings, ornaments, to make atonement for our lives before God. 
Moses and Eliezer the priest received the gold from them, all that fine crafted jewelry. In total, the gold from the commanders of thousands and hundreds that Moses and Eliezer offered as a gift to God weighed about 600 pounds, all donated by the soldiers who had taken the spoils. Moses and Eliezer took the gold from the commanders of thousands and hundreds and brought it to the tent of meeting, to serve as a reminder for the people of Israel before God. The families of Reuben and Gad had huge herds of livestock. They saw that the country of Jazer and Gilead was just the place for grazing livestock. And so they came, the families of Gad and of Reuben, and spoke to Moses and Eliezer the priest and the leaders of the congregation, saying, Adaroth, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Elili, Sebum, Nebo, and Beon, the country that God laid low before the community of Israel is a country just right for livestock, and we have livestock. They continued, If you think we've done a good job so far, give us this country for our inheritance. Don't make us go across the Jordan. Moses answered the families of Gad and Reuben, Do you mean that you are going to leave the fighting that's ahead to your brothers while you settle down here? Why would you even think of letting the people of Israel down, demoralizing them just as they're about to move into the land God gave them. That's exactly what your ancestors did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to survey the country. They went as far as the valley of Eshkol, took one look and quit. They completely demoralized the people of Israel from entering the land God had given them. And God got angry, oh, did he get angry? He swore, they'll never get to see it, none of those who came up out of Egypt who are twenty years and older will ever get to see the land that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They weren't interested in following me, their hearts weren't in it. None, except for Caleb son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, and Joshua son of Nun, they followed me, their hearts were in it. God's anger smoked against Israel. He made them wander in the wilderness for forty years, until that entire generation that acted out evil in his sight had died out. And now here you are, just one more mob of sinners stepping up to replace your ancestors, throwing fuel on the already blazing anger of God against Israel. If you won't follow him, he'll do it again. He'll dump them in the desert and the disaster will be all your fault. They came close to him and said, All we want to do is build corrals for our livestock and towns for our families. Then we'll take up arms and take the front lines, leading the people of Israel to their place. We'll be able to leave our families behind, secure in fortified towns, safe from those who live in the land. But we won't go back home until every Israelite is in full possession of his inheritance. We won't expect any inheritance west of the Jordan, we are claiming all our inheritance east of the Jordan. Moses said, If you do what you say, take up arms before God for battle and together go across the Jordan ready, before God, to fight until God has cleaned his enemies out of the land, then when the land is secure you will have fulfilled your duty to God and Israel. Then this land will be yours to keep before God. But if you don't do what you say, you will be sinning against God, you can be sure that your sin will track you down. So, go ahead. Build towns for your families and corrals for your livestock. Do what you said you'd do. The families of Gad and Reuben told Moses, We will do as our master commands. Our children and wives, our flocks and herds will stay behind here in the towns of Gilead. But we, every one of us fully armed, will cross the river to fight for God, just as our master has said. So Moses issued orders for them to Eliezer the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the ancestral tribes of the people of Israel. Moses said, 
If the families of Gad and Reuben crossed the Jordan River with you and before God, all armed and ready to fight, then after the land is secure, you may give them the land of Gilead as their inheritance. But if they don't cross over with you, they'll have to settle up with you in Canaan. The families of Gad and Reuben responded, We will do what God has said. We will cross the Jordan before God, ready and willing to fight. But the land we inherit will be here, to the east of the Jordan. Moses gave the families of Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh son of Joseph the kingdom of Sion, king of the Amorites, and the kingdom of O.G., king of Bashan, the land, its towns, and all the territories connected with them, the works. The Gadites rebuilt Dibon, Adaroth, Eroer, Atroth Shaphan, Jazer, Jogbiha, Beth Nimra, and Beth Haran as fortified cities, they also built corrals for their animals. The Reubenites rebuilt Heshbon, Elili, and Kiriathaim, also Nebo and Balmian in Sibma. They renamed the cities that they rebuilt. The family of Makir son of Manasseh went to Gilead, captured it, and drove out the Amorites who lived there. Moses then gave Gilead to the Machirites, the descendants of Manasseh. They moved in and settled there. Jair, another son of Manasseh, captured some villages and named them Havath Jair, Jair's tent camps. Noba captured Kanath and its surrounding camps. He renamed it after himself, Noba. These are the camping sites in the journey of the people of Israel after they left Egypt, deployed militarily under the command of Moses and Aaron. Under God's instruction Moses kept a log of every time they moved, camp by camp. They marched out of Ramesses the day after the Passover. It was the fifteenth day of the first month. They marched out heads high and confident. The Egyptians, busy burying their firstborn whom God had killed, watched them go. God had exposed the nonsense of their gods. The people of Israel left Ramesses and camped at Sukkot. Left Sukkot and camped at Etham at the edge of the wilderness. Left Etham, circled back to Pi Hahirath east of Baal Zephon, and camped near Migdal. Left Pi Hahirath and crossed through the sea into the wilderness, three days into the wilderness of Etham they camped at Mara. Left Mara and came to Elim where there were twelve springs and seventy palm trees, they camped there. Left Elim and camped by the Red Sea. Left the Red Sea and camped in the wilderness of Sin. Left the wilderness of Sin and camped at Dafka. Left Dafka and camped at Alush. Left Alush and camped at Rephidim where there was no water for the people to drink. Left Rephidim and camped in the wilderness of Sinai. Left the wilderness of Sinai and camped at Kaibroth Hadavava. Left Kaibroth Hadavava and camped at Hazroth. Left Hazroth and camped at Rithma. Left Rithma and camped at Rimen Perez. Left Rimen Perez and camped at Libna. Left Libna and camped at Rissa. Left Rissa and camped at Kehelatha. Left Kehelatha and camped at Mount Sheper. Left Mount Sheper and camped at Harada. Left Harada and camped at Makaloth. Left Makaloth and camped at Tahath. Left Tahath and camped at Tura. Left Tura and camped at Mithka. Left Mithka and camped at Hashmana. Left Hashmana and camped at Mosroth. Left Mosroth and camped at Bene Jokin. Left Bene Jokin and camped at Hor Hagadgad. Left Hor Hagadgad and camped at Jokbatha. Left Jokbatha and camped at Abrona. Left Abrona and camped at Ezean Jeber. 
left Ezi and Jeber and camped at Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. After they left Kadesh and camped at Mount Hor at the border of Edom, Aaron the priest climbed Mount Hor at God's command and died there. It was the first day of the fifth month in the fortieth year after the people of Israel had left Egypt. Aaron was 123 years old when he died on Mount Hor. The Canaanite king of Arad, he ruled in the Negev of Canaan, heard that the people of Israel had arrived. They left Mount Hor and camped at Zalmona. Left Zalmona and camped at Punan. Left Punan and camped at Oboth. Left Oboth and camped at I Abram on the border of Moab. Left Iam and camped at Dibon Gad. Left Dibon Gad and camped at Alman Diblathame. Left Alman Diblathame and camped in the mountains of Abram, across the river within sight of Nebo. After they left the mountains of Abram they camped on the plains of Moab at Jordan Jericho. On the plains of Moab their camp stretched along the banks of the Jordan from Beth Jeshemoth to Abel Shittim, Acacia Meadow. God spoke to Moses on the plains of Moab at Jordan Jericho, tell the people of Israel, when you cross the Jordan into the country of Canaan, drive out the native population before you, destroy their carved idols, destroy their cast images, level their worship mounds so that you take over the land and make yourself at home in it, I've given it to you. It's yours. Divide up the land by lot according to the size of your clans, large clans will get large tracts of land, small clans will get smaller tracts of land. However the lot falls, that's it. Divide it up according to your ancestral tribes. But if you don't drive out the native population, everyone you let stay there will become a cinder in your eye and a splinter in your foot. They'll give you endless trouble right in your own backyards. And I'll start treating you the way I plan to treat them. God spoke to Moses, command the people of Israel. Tell them, when you enter Canaan, these are the borders of the land you are getting as an inheritance. Your southern border will take in some of the wilderness of Zin where it touches Edom. It starts in the east at the Dead Sea, curves south of Scorpion Pass and on to Zin, continues south of Kadesh Barnea, then to Hazar Adder and on to Asman, where it takes a turn to the northwest to the Brook of Egypt and on to the Mediterranean Sea. Your western border will be the Mediterranean Sea. Your northern border runs on a line from the Mediterranean Sea to Mount Hor, and from Mount Hor to Lebo Hamath, connects to Zedad, continues to Zifrin, and ends at Hazar Anan. This is your northern border. Your eastern border runs on a line from Hazar Anan to Shifam. The border goes south from Shifam to Ribla to the east of Ain, and continues along the slopes east of the Sea of Galilee. The border then follows the Jordan River and ends at the Dead Sea. This is your land with its four borders. Moses then commanded the people of Israel, This is the land, divide up the inheritance by lot. God has ordered it to be given to the nine and a half tribes. The tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh have already received their inheritance, the two tribes and the half-tribe got their inheritance east of Jordan Jericho, facing the sunrise. God spoke to Moses, These are the men who will be in charge of distributing the inheritance of the land, Eleazar the priest and Joshua son of Nun. Assign one leader from each tribe to help them in distributing the land. Assign these. Caleb son of Jephunneh from the tribe of Judah. Shemuel son of Amahud from the tribe of Simeon. Elidad son of Kislan from the tribe of Benjamin. Bucky son of Jogli, leader from the tribe of Dan. Haniel son of Ephod, leader from the tribe of Manasseh son of Joseph. Kemuel son of Shiftan, leader from the tribe of Ephraim son of Joseph. 
Elizaphan's son of Parnak, leader from the tribe of Zebulun. Paltiel son of Azan, leader from the tribe of Issachar. Ahahud son of Shalomi, leader from the tribe of Asher. Pedahel son of Amahad, leader from the tribe of Naphtali. These are the men God commanded to hand out the assignments of land inheritance to the people of Israel in the country of Canaan. Then God spoke to Moses on the plains of Moab at Jordan Jericho, command the people of Israel to give the Levites as their part of the total inheritance towns to live in. Make sure there is plenty of pasture around the towns. Then they will be well taken care of with towns to live in and pastures for their cattle, flocks, and other livestock. The pasture surrounding the Levites' towns is to extend 1,500 feet in each direction from the city wall. The outside borders of the pasture are to measure 3,000 feet on each of the four sides, east, south, west, and north, with the town at the center. Each city will be supplied with pasture. Six of these towns that you give the Levites will be asylum cities to which anyone who accidentally kills another person may flee for asylum. In addition, you will give them 42 other towns, 48 towns in all, together with their pastures. The towns that you give the Levites from the common inheritance of the people of Israel are to be taken in proportion to the size of each tribe, many towns from a tribe that has many, few from a tribe that has few. God spoke to Moses, speak to the people of Israel. Tell them, when you cross the river Jordan into the country of Canaan, designate your asylum cities, towns to which a person who accidentally kills someone can flee for asylum. They will be places of refuge from the avenger so that the alleged murderer won't be killed until he can appear before the community in court. Provide six asylum cities. Designate three of the towns to the east side of the Jordan, the other three in Canaan proper, asylum cities for the people of Israel, for the foreigner, and for any occasional visitors or guests, six asylum cities to run to for anyone who accidentally kills another. But if the killer has used an iron object, that's just plain murder, he's obviously a murderer and must be put to death. Or if he has a rock in his hand big enough to kill and the man dies, that's murder, he's a murderer and must be put to death. Or if he's carrying a wooden club heavy enough to kill and the man dies, that's murder, he's a murderer and must be put to death. In such cases the avenger has a right to kill the murderer when he meets him, he can kill him on the spot. And if out of sheer hatred a man pushes another or from ambush throws something at him and he dies, or angrily hits him with his fist and kills him, that's murder, he must be put to death. The avenger has a right to kill him when he gets him. If, however, he impulsively pushes someone and there is no history of hard feelings, or he impetuously picks up something and throws it, or he accidentally drops a stone tool, a maul or hammer, say, and it hits and kills someone he didn't even know was there, and there's no suspicion that there was bad blood between them, the community is to judge between the killer and the avenger following these guidelines. It's the task of the community to save the killer from the hand of the avenger, the community is to return him to his asylum city to which he fled. He must stay there until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. But if the murderer leaves the asylum city to which he has fled, and the avenger finds him outside the borders of his asylum city, the avenger has a right to kill the murderer. And he's not considered guilty of murder. So it's important that he stay in his asylum city until the death of the high priest. After the death of the high priest he is free to return to his own place. These are the procedures for making judgments from now on, wherever you live. Anyone who kills another may be executed only on the testimony of eyewitnesses. 
But no one can be executed on the testimony of only one witness. Don't accept bribe money in exchange for the life of a murderer. He's guilty and deserves the death penalty. Put him to death. And don't accept bribe money for anyone who has fled to an asylum city so as to permit him to go back and live in his own place before the death of the high priest. Don't pollute the land in which you live. Murder pollutes the land. The land can't be cleaned up of the blood of murder except through the blood of the murderer. Don't desecrate the land in which you live. I live here, too, I, God, live in the same neighborhood with the people of Israel. The heads of the ancestral clan of Gilead son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, they were from the clans of the descendants of Joseph, approached Moses and the leaders who were heads of the families in the people of Israel. They said, when God commanded my master to hand over the inheritance lands by lot to the people of Israel, my master was also commanded by God to hand over the inheritance land of Zelophehad our brother to his daughters. But what happens if they marry into another tribe in the people of Israel? Their inheritance land will be taken out of our ancestral tribe and get added into the tribe into which they married. And then when the year of Jubilee comes for the people of Israel their inheritance will be lumped in with the inheritance of the tribe into which they married, their land will be removed from our ancestors' inheritance. Moses, at God's command, issued this order to the people of Israel, what the tribe of the sons of Joseph says is right. This is God's command to Zelophehad's daughters, they are free to marry anyone they choose as long as they marry within their ancestral clan. The inheritance land of the people of Israel must not get passed around from tribe to tribe. No, keep the tribal inheritance land in the family. Every daughter who inherits land, regardless of the tribe she is in, must marry a man from within her father's tribal clan. Every Israelite is responsible for making sure the inheritance stays within the ancestral tribe. No inheritance land may be passed from tribe to tribe, each tribe of the people of Israel must hold tight to its own land. Zelophehad's daughters did just as God commanded Moses. Mala, Tirzah, Hagla, Milka, and Noah, Zelophehad's daughters, all married their cousins on their father's side. They married within the families of Manasseh son of Joseph and their inheritance lands stayed in their father's family. These are the commands and regulations that God commanded through the authority of Moses to the people of Israel on the plains of Moab at Jordan Jericho.